Hello and welcome to the Petrie Podcast. Today's guest is freelance rugby journalist Jess Hayden, who's been featured in The Times, The Guardian uh, and BBC Radio 2. Did I, did I miss anywhere else, Jess? Or is that, <laughs> is that, ever, is that, is that, is that the main ones? They're the main ones. I recently wrote for the British and Irish Lions, but they're kind of like the, the papers and the BBC, the main ones, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, well, thanks for coming on, first of all. I uh, really appreciate it. And I'm hoping to delve more into women's rugby, something that obviously I know about, but not probably to the extent that I, I, I would want to know. Right, yeah, no, it's something that a lot of um, men's rugby fans just don't really seem to, to watch. And you can understand why it's got kind of a, a bad reputation, I guess. Um, but it's growing and hopefully we can kind of extend the fan base more. So it's great to be here and thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I was going to, I was going to ask actually, um, so, you know, football now, it's obviously women's football has been so much bigger for ages. And I think, I think Bill Beaumont talked about how in America, you've got this sort of wave or tsunami of soccer mums, you know, the sort of cult, the culture they have there, but he was saying how he wants to recreate that in rugby. Is that, is, is that something good to aim for? Or is, is he maybe, he's not stereotype or anything. I guess that, that, I think that is part of the culture there and it's good for women's football. Um, in America, is that something that you'd want to see rugby recreate, maybe in different terminology? <laughs> so. So, yeah, I guess for me, soccer mum means the the mums of the boys that play football, the girls that play football, and they stand with the big coat and the flask. And <laughs> and the but um, yeah, I think you know if we can follow the the path of women's football and have this much more gender balanced fan base and players and that would be fantastic um I think I I, I think a rugby mum is quite a funny term I guess they're the ones in the big rugby coats that stand in uh, in the freezing cold watching as well but it's a nice thing I think I, I do get this bit of a gender stereotype calling someone a, a soccer mum or a rugby mum but I think most of the time it's meant in a very positive way bringing women into sport yeah I, I think it's quite it's an, it's an endearing term I, I I would say really um I, I wouldn't say it's used negatively Ooh. No, but maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, no, 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 I had a first question. It was quite interesting. I saw it on the news. And it was like a news story saying former Wales international turned MP, uh, Gower MP, uh, Tonia Antoniesi said, well, rugby is dominated by the men's game and men. I'd say that's pretty fair. Uh, and that in 25 years, nowhere near, nowhere near the progress had been made that, that needed to be made, um, that needed to be. Uh, is, is that fair? Well, 25 years is a long time, isn't it? And I think we've definitely seen waves of progress in that time in women's rugby. Uh, we've kind of gone from a completely amateur um, game to where we're seeing professional and semi-professional players. Uh, yeah, maybe we could have seen it a bit faster, but actually I think the progress that we're making is fantastic and should be celebrated. The, the, there, there is a lot that World Rugby are doing. So they've set forward this plan from 2017 to 2025. It's all about bringing uh, women's rugby uh, equal to men's or at least trying, making those steps forward to progress the women's game. So, yes, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a problem with the fact that there's only one woman on the uh, World Rugby exec board, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not um, kind of effort going into the women's game. And I think we are, we are seeing that. A, a truly global scale there there is much more effort from world rugby into the women's game so i was going to say on the there's a good point you made i was going to, I was going to mention that with the executive committee only one out of 12 and it's um angela Ruggiero. uh seem, seem, seems to be her name she's one out of the 12 who, on the executive committee who is a woman but on the world rugby council it's like i think 17 out of 50 uh of the votes are, are women now so that I, I can i can see a conscious effort um I, I, can you yeah, definitely. I, I mean, um, World Rugby are doing some amazing things. Like they've got a women's executive leadership scholarship now that's had like 37 women so far take part in it. And they're really trying to push women at exec levels, at all levels of the game, um, coaching, playing straight through to kind of these leadership boards. They're really, they really are trying. And there was a lot, um, a lot on Twitter about there are more men called Brett on the World Rugby board than there are women, which... <laughs> is true um but yeah i think we are seeing progress and it's not going to be we're never going to see kind of a quota in rugby where we have half men half women because it wouldn't reflect the, the modern game it wouldn't reflect where we are um but it is it is good progress and i'm really excited to see what she does because angela used to be on the um international olympic committee oh, okay. and has 
has worked you know with it within that committee to build representation of women's sports so i'm very positive about the future of of world rugby for women you know rugby for women so if you were to choose maybe one woman to to be in there you'd probably choose her um yeah i guess so i mean <laughs> oh, there are so many there are so many to pick from but i guess um angela brings this she's got experience on a board and a, a world board you know the olympic committee so uh yeah i think she is a fantastic appointment how, how many more people do you reckon or say more women do you reckon should be on the board than out of 12 because as you say you know it's the same with england and france financially for world rugby i mean they are the staples you know they've got their independent leagues they bring a lot of money in and their international sides obviously two countries as well england france economically strong they do have most of the money coming in for the world game. So it's it's a hard one, isn't it? It's like your finances and economics of the game. So obviously they should have a big say. But then also there's, well, how, how are you going to improve the rest of the game if you don't give them a voice? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I, for an actual number, I, I think it's hard to say because we can't assume that the men on the board aren't going to try and progress the women's game um, and that the women on the, on the board aren't the only ones kind of fighting for the women's game. But... In terms of representation, I think that it'd be nice to have a, a couple more, a few more. Um, I, I can't really comment on who who I would put forward, who I would course, appoint. Yeah, yeah. But there, there are there are um, many women at a high level in rugby globally, um, we, especially in Africa. We're seeing that women are really leading the way. Um, in like in Madagascar, for example, the the head of rugby there, head of women's rugby there, is a woman, which is really nice to see that we're seeing this kind of global shift towards having women. Oh, well, the head of actual rugby for Madagascar, the union, is a woman? I think it's the head of the women's rugby. Sorry, okay. not head of rugby. But we're seeing okay. this kind of movement towards having women in um, kind of the decision-making chair, which is really nice to see. And I hope that we will see that, uh, you know, mirrored in the in the World Rugby Board soon. Yeah, I was, I was actually mentioning I got on... World Rugby set a target of having 40% of their coaches. I know this isn't uh, in the executive chairs and stuff, but I also think the progress there is obviously really important. You want decision makers to be to be what you you want decision makers to be women who are making decisions on women's rugby. You know, I, I think I think so, don't you? And even 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 men's rugby, I'd say. Yeah, no, definitely. We are seeing it slowly. I mean, Rachel Taylor uh, was the she played. She's a Wales international, ex Wales international. And she coached RGC. She coaches them at the minute. I think she's like a, uh, either. I think she's kind of head coach with someone else. I'm not quite sure. She might be a skills coach or something. But oh, that's RGC a big role. That, that's actually a pretty big role. Like that, they are the. You, you would say RGC. If if listeners don't know or viewers don't know, RGC is how how would you describe them, Jess? It's you. You go first, and I'll try. I'll probably get it really wrong. <laughs> well, they're a North Walian um, men's rugby side that don't really get much um uh they don't they don't get the same regional exposure exposure as southern welsh <laughs> sides do but they are it's a it's more of a culture than a rugby team rgc i would say it's a massive club it is it is, it is a massive club because they're in north wales and they're literally the only sort of rugby entity in north wales of course they're not yeah. the only one but the the a lot, you know, the, the only sort of big one, and they they just they they attract probably most of the population in North Wales. If they're following rugby side, it's going to be them. So that because of that, they've got a bigger core fan base than probably most usual uh, principality sides. I'd I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. They they do. They they kind of as you say, the only massive team in North Wales. So there's a massive kind of chunk of of not only Welsh people going to watch it, but also people in the north of England who are more union fans and league kind of go over to RGC as well. It's quite some way. It's a, it's far into Wales, but it's a, it's a, it's a lovely club. I've, I've never been actually to the, to the club, but it is, it is lovely. And it is great to see that Rachel Taylor's kind of taken such a, a, a prominent role there. Um, she's been part of the Women's Sports Leadership Academy that World Rugby brought in. And it's basically seven... Uh, women's coaches who who coach 15s it's quite important because there are more kind of female coaches in sevens and it's a it's a pilot program um, that's kind of in partnership with the International Olympic Committee but it's it's been a fantastic way to get women in rugby into coaching positions and just to, to give women the confidence to be able to coach both men and women's rugby so we might see we, we might see even more uh, women in in 
coaching in both the women's and the men's game but it is it is lovely to see well it's, it's a great role for her and that's such a great initiative as well um you would imagine if it all goes to plan then there's only going to be more of this which is which is great um i was saying before i got distracted and that that is going to be a common theme uh, throughout this um for we, but yeah, World Rugby said forty percent of coaches at the twenty twenty five World Cup, uh, Women's World Cup, they want to be women. Um, do you reckon that's? Because do you reckon that's a beneficial thing to do long term? I mean, obviously it's going to it's going to develop coaches, but you also don't want uh, a woman coach in there who isn't who isn't up to the job. Just you know, you don't want people in there who who just because they're a woman, you want them in there because they're they're good at the job. Yeah, I mean, I guess. What's, if, if you're new to women's rugby and, and you're kind of unaware of the game or you've watched a, a couple of England games and that's it, it's a very different game to the men's game. And when you look at kind of the grassroots level, um, the women tend to get as a coach the prop who's injured in the men's team. And that has always kind of been the case. And up to professional or international levels, we're seeing that we're, you know the standard of coaching is getting higher and higher. So it's not to say that, that these will be women who shouldn't be there but it's just about identifying coaching talent in women and allowing them to the space to do that and you know when you look at the coaching levels I think at level three there are there there are barely any women who have completed that course um level three coaching and, and higher so we really need to encourage women to do that and world rugby are trying they've got you know they've got a number of these these pathways and strategies in place and I think we have 50 women so far on a pathway um, to, the, to coach at a high level. I think that if, it's very hard to explain, but if you, men's rugby and women's rugby are so different that if we have women who have played rugby, they're gonna understand the game a lot better than a man who's played international rugby because it is different. I mean, you see in football, you have Jo Ellis leading the USA women's soccer team to two World Cups. And, you know, we, we have Phil Neville. Is he the right man to lead the women's football team? I think the players would say no. It's, it's the men and women's sports are so different. And I think we need to kind of encourage women into coaching positions because they do understand the game having played it better than men do who come in having not watched women's rugby, don't really understand it that much and try to kind of coach the male way. Well, uh, what difference, obviously you've got... Um... Is this a factor in the sense that if you're, a, if I'm a woman player, would I feel more comfortable talking about a personal issue to a, a female coach than a men coach? Is that is that is that something as well? No, I think um, boundaries are broken down too quickly for that to be an issue because obviously you know there's you don't have much personal boundaries in a rugby team anyway. Um, so I don't think it's so much that. I think it's just that the style of the game is so different in women and men's rugby. We you see um, less contact, less hard contact, less uh, play, like fewer players at the ruck. It's fast. It's a faster game. There's more passing. There are more knock-ons. There are therefore more scrums. There are more lineouts. There are more mistakes being made. So it's a it's a it is a different game. Um, and I think a lot of um, men see it as that it's what m men's rugby was like before it went professional, when it was amateur. But there are differences. And I think if we coach women's rugby to play men's rugby it's not the same as teaching women to play better women's rugby do you agree with that statement at all on that it was it's, it was like men's rugby before it came fully professional is there any truth in that or not no because men's rugby was we were still seeing differences in the number of uh, scrums line outs we were seeing um the you know, contact is completely different the kind of the level of impacts is different there are so many differences that truly you you really can't compare them even if you are looking at most of women's rugby being amateur now you there is still not really a comparison why would you say the differences are is it i mean i mean must a selection it must be biological differences um you know as in you know the, the game will just be more physical because men are larger are larger than women um is, is that is that where the differences are and is that the is that a large proportion of it or is it is it other things too there is a biological difference um because we see that the men are bigger they're stronger they're running faster there are lots of differences but it's all kind of uh, comparative so in men's rugby there's been this shift to be the biggest the heaviest the strongest for years and that's kind yeah. of been growing for years and years when women's rugby we still have players like jazz joyce for wales who is 
tiny, but she's incredible. Um, and you have this, you, you don't have that kind of, we need to be the biggest players possible. So it is different. That means you see a faster style of play. Um, there are also ways that rugby isn't necessarily as easy for women to play as it is for a man. And it, it sounds really stupid, but there's a, there has been a study into the size of the ball in, in rugby that a man, a typical man can pick up the ball with one hand, but I've been playing for, um, not for that long, but about four years, and I still can't pick up the ball with one hand because my hands are small. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are things like that. And yeah, you, you know, Fafta Clerk might struggle, but um, most men's players can... That, 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 that's funny I feel very emasculated now because I'm not a big guy I'm like five seven five eight and um I've, I've got pretty I wasn't a tiny but I'd say the small hands on average and I always would see like you know my mates who were in the forwards just walk up to the ball and pick it up um and I would just I would look at them like what the hell like because then, then, then I'll try, try it myself and then I, I'm, I'm there like I'm there like you know veins coming out of my head getting really vasculated like just about getting the ball off the ground with one hand um so I really feel the pain uh, on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's only one tiny example, but there are plenty of kind of uh, biological differences between men and rugby, and the game isn't any different. The pitch is the same size. Everything is the same in men and women's rugby. So, yeah, you're going to see you're gonna see some of those differences. We're, we're not as fast as, as men, but there has been a really interesting study that took place at Swansea University about concussion rates in, in rugby and showed that women were kind of disproportionately affected by concussion. And that I think is because we, you know, some, I, I've played all, all positions really in the backs and a couple of times at number eight. And when I, when I was on the wing, um, I'm quite big, like I'm a massive winger. I should not feel, I'm, I'm a prop in disguise really, but I'd be playing against girls who were, you know, half my size and it just isn't fair on them. And you just get, you, you know, you go into contact, you just think, ah, oh, you know, this is so wrong. And at an international level, that's not really a problem because you do see much more of a standard size for women's rugby players, but there will be smaller girls. And that means that concussions can be worse. Injuries can be worse. Is, is that because in, in women's rugby, you would have, you know, say there's a girl who's five foot ten, reasonably built against. You can get a girl, her opposite winger, as you were saying, could be four foot ten uh, and yeah. weigh nothing. So like in rugby, even I mean, I know I'm not, I'm not, a, like, I'm not a big guy by any stretch of imagination, but you know, I can, you know, I go to the gym, you know, I can sort of handle myself to a certain degree, even if I go up against someone who's six foot three. So maybe the, you know, the the worst case scenario in rugby for men's on the wings would would probably not be as destructive physically as maybe as it would with a woman is that is that a fair sort of comparison yeah probably if you're looking at kind of the the grassroots um the lower levels of rugby if you're mm -hmm. looking at kind of the professional or premiership levels then no it's not as big of a problem but yeah it is something that i would take into account for sure at grassroots level yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um Okay, so as World Rugby recently came out and said that women's rugby has had 28% growth year on year, with more girls getting into the sport than boys for the third year running. Uh, shouldn't they be praised for this? Or do you think the figures uh, and where they come, came from should be looked into? As in the sense of, you can always find, you know, I did it myself uh, with university, you can always find figures <laughs> and spin them to whatever you want to make the point of. Um, you, know, it, it, I, you know, I guess they're putting them out there. They're from um, Nielsen. Um, who are a pretty solid company. But first of all, I mean, that, that must be brilliant, you know, getting 28% growth year on year. Um, and obviously it's saying more girls getting into sport than boys for the third year running. Would you, would you say that's sort of uh, concurrent with the worldview? Um, and, and probably, you know, is that good for World Rugby to release stuff like that out there to inspire people? Yeah, I mean, I think it's true. I, I, if I'm correct, the, I think those figures tend to be com comparing uh, the women's game with the women's game the year before and not the women's and the men's game together. I'm not quite sure. It's, but... it's, it's, so, yeah, you're right, you're right there. It's women's. But then they, they've also said that with more girls getting into sport than boys for the third year running. So the, the women's game is growing year on year. But then as they're also saying that women are getting into the sport more than boys now, as in a sense, because I guess, I guess more women were less into it maybe possibly before the men were from the beginning. I don't know. 
Yeah, I think we, we, we are seeing a massive growth in women's rugby. It's the fastest growing women's sport in the UK, for example. It is, on a global scale, it is growing massively and it's fantastic. I, I, don't, I, don't quite, um, I don't quite know how we can compare it to men's because so many boys kind of play consistently through, through from you know, early age to, to men, whereas women don't come into rugby generally until they're a bit older. Most yeah. women don't start playing rugby until they're over 18 uh, through university sports. So it's, it's a difficult one to kind of say how many people are playing rugby because... And, and, and how, how do you distinguish a, a fan as well or a player, you know, because it, someone rocks up on the weekend, does one game and vanishes forever? You, you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how to distinguish what, what a player or fan is. I don't know, is it someone who turns up once? Yeah, I, I, I think that there, there, is, there is probably a distinction, but I'm assuming it's probably who are on the books, who have, who have paid subs, who are, um, a, who's a member of each club, but... Yeah, I think I think as you say, should they um, release these kind of this kind of information? I think it is good to to make girls think. Oh, actually, there are loads of women. There are loads of girls playing this sport. Even if I'm the only person in my school playing, I still think I should go. So for kids, I think it's fantastic. For older women, I think as well, it's just that. Oh wow, loads of people are doing this. It's not football. I might have a go. Yeah, because I, I I only question it because uh, the. I don't want to call Twitter a cesspit, but there's a dark side of Twitter. Oh, yeah. And of course, anything that, it, it seems that anything that gets tweeted can be attacked, even if it comes out in a positive way. And I saw some people questioning whether, you know, they're just trying to push us out there, you know, for, for, for spin, um, it just as well spin it in a positive light. But even if that, if that is the case, then it's, you know, and it, get, and it gets, you know, you know, 10 girls see it and get into rugby, then that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Um, also seen this that 49% of rugby fans in Europe and 50% in Americas uh, are apparently women. Now, I, you know, I've gone to a bunch of Six Nations games, other matches, and the crowd, to be fair, it does seem pretty, pretty split, but I'm not sure if it's 50-50, like they're saying. I, I can't comment on Americas because I you know, haven't lived in, South, in North or South America and watched rugby, but Jess, what, what do you reckon? 49% of rugby fans in Europe are apparently women in Europe as well, actually, not just, not just uh, Britain. I mean, I, 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 I assume that that figure is correct. I think when you go to, to matches, you do see that there are so many more women at rugby matches than there ever are at football matches, for example. Yes, yeah. We are, we are seeing that there is a, a massive growth. When they say fans, though, not supporters, I don't know how they're testing that because is it who's watching, the, who's actually going to support teams and watching the rugby or who's watching the rugby at home and is just a fan of rugby. It's a difficult one, but I do think that we that rugby in general attracts a, a female audience much more than football does or cricket does, for example. Why, why, why do you think that is? Like my, my mum, like my mum. Sorry, sorry. Go, go on. Go on. <laughs> just say, have you seen Johnny May? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's unfair. It, that's it, it's, unfair. it's purely purely eye candy purposes, not because they even like the sport. Okay, <laughs> it's like... no, definitely not. I was just joking. There's, a... <laughs> I think, I think it's it's more interesting than football to as a spectator because there's more going on. There's loads to learn. It's much more of a culture of rugby where it's a bit more inclusive than football is. I think when you go to the pub, and I remember when I was first getting into uh, rugby. When you, when you go to the pub and people will explain the laws to you and no one really understands entirely everything that's going on when they're in the pub, like people who are just watching that kind of uh, level of rugby. It's nice. I think it is nice. I think pe women appreciate the kind of community aspects of rugby as well. So there are many reasons. And I, but I do, yeah, I do think it's that kind of community level and a, a tiny bit of Johnny May. And tiny bit of anyway, so it's 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 mostly you know the fans who do a great job uh, of of getting people into it. Um, so that's I guess I guess men are doing a good job there in that sense in in pubs at explaining it. So yeah, you, you had I was going to ask actually. So you had you had positive experiences when you were first getting into seeing watching it at the pub and stuff. You you had good experiences from that with people explaining it to you and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, so I was in a very lucky position. I started playing rugby at university and the head of rugby 
or that the head of uh, women's rugby, the head coach at the time, was Shuan Lillycrap, who's the captain of Wales. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she wasn't at the time, but she she was a massive influence um, over me in like my first year playing rugby and kind of being into rugby. But I just had a coach that um, called Cookie who really wanted to encourage women into the game, really really supportive, and he took me to. Well, we went to the pubs in the in the mornings for the British Irish Lions games and he would just kind of explain everything, even if it meant him missing some of the match. And I think that kind of experience is formative for women because we're so used to like, oh, the football's on, you know, <laughs> staying, don't ask questions. So it's quite nice, actually, I think, to have those kind of figures who are just like really happy to explain um, and I'm also lucky. My boyfriend works in rugby. Uh, he he works with Welsh Rugby Union, and um, he is happy to pause the telly and explain something to me when I was kind of first getting into rugby. And he'd be very kind of supportive of that, even if it kind of ruined the game for him. So I think those, yeah, I have been very lucky. I would say, you know, Swansea Uni have this incredible rugby pathway that kind of emphasises performance and fun and stuff like that. So it's been really, I was definitely very supported going into rugby. That's great. I'm sure that's, 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 that's what people want to hear for the, um, for the game, for the game worldwide is that, is that people, they're getting supported and then, you know, welcomed into the game, um, if anything. And that, I guess that that experience makes you actually want to stay a fan long-term. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Also, here it says that girls and women are the main driving force for, I guess, promoting uh, the, the sort of fan base growth as well, what Robbie was saying. Um, I guess is what we were talking about earlier, in the sense that there's just, you know, I guess the baseline would be a lot higher for men who are already fans of the game. And I guess it would be lower for women. And obviously, the men get into it earlier. So then I guess there's a spike when all these female fans get into it. Would, would you say that's correct or not? Yeah. I th yeah, no, I think women are you know, sharing the game with others. I recently joined a club in Essex who are, everyone is new to rugby and then they're, you know, by the start of the season, they didn't have a clue and by, about anything to do with rugby. They could play, but they just didn't watch rugby or really kind of get it. And now they do, their friends do, they bring people in. I think women are brilliant at um, getting friends involved, maybe in a way that men aren't. And that's <laughs> kind of the thing. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I don't, I, I guess it's one of those things we can all have an opinion on whether women are the main driving forces behind this this growing fan base. Um, but but yeah, I think I think they are. I think I can see it in my day to day life. I, I you know research women's rugby. I play women's rugby. I talk about it a lot. I can see that there there are women behind rugby who are really pushing it. That just make for me for every sport. Why you know why isn't I guess they are to be fair. Why why isn't every sport push for you know having the same amount of women playing as men? Because they always going to be. I mean, economically it's positive as well. Obviously, you want it to happen anyway for equality purposes and to look a better game to be more inclusive. But I mean, financially as well. I mean, it, it's it will benefit because you're getting twice the people then investing in your sport as well. I mean, you know, it's, it's another way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. There will be people who agree with that, but we do we do kind of see a lot of um, a lot of people who don't want to support women's rugby grow, or they don't want to see it grow alongside men. They don't see it as like a you know, they don't see it that you can compare the two, and in many ways you can't. But I don't think that should stop you trying to support the female counterparts. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say um. Like, did you believe in time with like sort of fe female membership only going to grow? You'd imagine uh, that more female voices will, will be sort of, I guess, I guess heard because I like, imagine an increase in fans of being females and only the uh, more responses of, of changing the game for the for women's sake w would happen. Yeah, I think it, again, it's these kind of world rugby pathways that they're putting in place to try and get women at the executive level. If we see this 2017 to 2025 World Rugby um, pathway complete, then we will see more women being heard at an international level. Yes, women are joining the game at a faster rate. They're uh, watching the game. They're they're supporters of the game. It just it, we have to just see, you know, what get what game are they watching? Where are who's in charge of that game? We talk about men's rugby here. We talk about women's rugby. It's those kind of things we need to consider. 
yes there will be more women on the world rugby council soon i hope don't know when but let's just i think you know in the net you know we're not we're not far off halfway if we're talking 17 out of 50 we may we may well see kind of like a a 50 50 split in the next five years it wouldn't surprise me is that when the the comments before from um you know the gower mp uh totally blanked on her name i'm, I'm not gonna Antonio thank you very much <laughs> jess um yeah is that on the comments from her maybe a bit, a bit i mean it's correct there are more brett's than than the women that is correct in the executive committee but you know like nearly 50 percent um you know I, I imagine it will get there will be women on the world rugby council so they're not it, it maybe came across they were doing a horrendous job and not even caring about women at all when i don't when i think if they're 17 out of 50 they're doing something right let's yeah they are i think we are seeing some amazing women in, in that council as well so we will see change we will see we will see it soon 17 out of 50 is not bad um for women there are women high up in all unions in the uk and further afield that who are either in the council or, or will be in the near future so i can see it being uh, 25 women 25 men by maybe five ten years for sure i think so i think i'd be, I'd be would i make a bet on that 10 i think i'd make a bet five, ten, <laughs> 10 i'd make a bet five five i'm i'm not sure um i don't know we'll see i think it's, it's going to come though and i was going to ask yeah. you um so Six Nations, I talked about, talked to this uh, with Pisho about this, and he was saying, he sort of agreed with me, that Six Nations, say for women's now, you've got you know, England who are basically, you know, they've got the Tyrrells 15, which is a professional league. They're all England are professionals. Is it, unf is it, you know, I get the Six Nations is the men's tournament, but they're all professional players. It, it, should they change the tournament in the sense, should they break it up that England maybe play New Zealand in some other championship and then that Wales and Scotland play uh, Spain, for example, who are similar rank to them in the world. Is, is, is that something that should be considered? Because logically it doesn't really, when I look at it, it doesn't really make sense having, and it can't be nice for your ego, just getting, you know, battered. Um, you know, England won the last five triple crowns, um, yeah. you know? So I, yeah, I don't know. Is, is, is that something that would be worth doing for the benefit of everyone? I don't. I th I see that that would just harm the the countries like Wales and Ireland who are completely amateur. Because you know, what if World Rugby's commitment is to make women's rugby genuinely competitive? And I don't think you can do that by scrapping competitions or taking away um, the the massive stage that, that playing in a tournament like the Six Nations gives it. If you yeah. if you take the, the those kind of countries apart and bring in um, countries like Spain you're not going to see the same viewership, I don't think. I think the fact that we can keep this Six Nations branding, no matter when it's played in the year, that's another, that's another question, but um, <laughs> having kind of, you know, the same name with it, I think gives it that, that support and the respect that it deserves. I think one thing to make really clear is that, one, England, the players really want the other nations to go pro. They are the first people supporting them. Uh, Casey Daly, I spoke to Casey Daly McLean um, over a year ago now, but she was saying how much she, they all really, really want to see more uh, professional contracts with Scotland, Ireland to go pro and Wales to go pro. And we're not, we're not ridiculously far off. I mean, only... A year or two ago, Wales were saying, not a chance, we're never going to ever support the, the women to become professional. But since, since coronavirus, I know that, um, the, uh, the, that Wales have been told, the Wales women have been told that they're going to they're gonna have budget increases, there may be money, not quite sure, but there are whispers of it. Scotland have got a couple of players now who have been supported by um, the Scottish Rugby Union. We're seeing progress. If we then completely rip up the Six Nations and make Wales play and other kind of Wales, Ireland, Scotland, whoever, play against teams outside of the Six Nations, I think we lose all of that progress. And we will only force unions to fund women's rugby if, they're, if they are being thrashed by a professional side like England. Because 
when you see those ridiculous score lines where England have absolutely thrashed Wales again, I'm, so, I'm sorry to bring up Wales so many times. <laughs> but, um, Savage Jess, and, just going into them. I know, especially because I'm like I'm friends with so many of the Wales players, so a bit scared. <laughs> from them, but when we see those massive score lines and England kind of thrashing Wales and and the other teams as well, <laughs> I think that kind of puts a light on the the inequality of it and the fact that so many of the Wales players and the Scotland and the Irish players they are on annual leave from a hard job these are doctors nurses um teachers everything students they are they they have so many different jobs and they work all day then they go to training then they you know then they take time off so they can play for Wales and they go back or whichever country then go back to work the day after sometimes or two days after. So I think we can't take the competition away from them because I think that would only harm the amateur nations. You make a really good point with the Six Nations branding. I don't know how I didn't even think about it. Um, it's Because also Scott, obviously it's on Sky Sports. And I imagine if you're Sky and they remove the Six Nations and call it the European Championship or something, you've got Wales was playing Spain and it's 9-9 in you know uh i don't know Kondasi or something you just, i just yeah i i can't see that sky being interested in that and, and with the with the sensations being on sky i mean it, that's only going to be good for promotion of the game yeah well just to be clear though not all uh, six nations women's rugby is on sky it's only the england game to ever england are playing is it so, really on oh, the england matches yeah so and sometimes if like a couple others but england have the deal oh, wales is on bbc wales isn't it BBC Wales or S4C or sometimes just S4C Facebook, <laughs> depending on what they want. But um, yeah, that's true. A lot of the games start at the same time within half an hour of each other in the Six Nations. So you, if you're a, a diehard fan like me, you kind of have to have a laptop going with S4C and a you know Sky Sports going if you want to watch Being two games game. at the same time. Yeah. I, I've never been able to do that. Like, um, can, you, can you actually watch two games at the same time properly? Not really, but you just kind of have to see where it's going. I guess that's the the only good thing about how stop and start women's rugby can be is that you can uh, <laughs> you normally have at least one game going. Or well, just just see a massive large chunk when like the scrums are just getting reset over and over again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's it? What else was I going? Oh yeah, yeah. I was going to ask him on um the the, Tyr- the Tyrrells rugby for for England. Like how, how I mean how important and and, and big is that as being it has that been for England and I guess professionalizing women's rugby because I guess it's something for like every other nation around the world as well which isn't professional like Wales and an island to aspire to have as well yeah I guess so if if you know if the listener doesn't know anything about domestic women's rugby the Tyrrells Premier 15 is in England and it's it's in it's 10 English teams uh in Wales you have regional rugby so the same it, it mirrors men's and in Scotland you have the tenors premiership and in Ireland you have another premiership so there are there are separate leagues and we don't have anything kind of similar to uh, a pro 14 or a a, a European championship cup anything like that we don't have this kind of club rugby in England the Tyrrells premier 15 has become um, slowly moving towards uh, professional rugby we're seeing kind of changes every three years it's not set in stone who's going to be in there there's kind of this like three-year decision audit um which just who which decides who's going to be in the premier 15s it you can you can argue two things for how good it's been for professionalization of the women's game you could argue that one while it's been fantastic for english players to become professional it's really not doing any favors for the um, the, the Scottish, Welsh or Irish teams at all because you have like so for example uh, Welsh players go into Bristol so Shiwan Lillycrack the Welsh captain plays yeah. in England um, so does Kira Bevan the Welsh um, scrum half you've got two so you've got Jade Conkor and Chloe Rolly from Scotland playing for Harlequins um, Clem um, Malloy playing who's an Irish flanker she's playing for Wasps there are so many others but some of basically some of the best players in the other countries are coming over and playing in the Tyrrells Premier 15s because they um, because they want that kind of experience playing in that league 
So yes, it's good for professionalisation for English players and the English league, but it is actually kind of really harming the Irish, Welsh and Scottish leagues. I guess because I, I um, live in Wales half and half, half live between Wales and half Essex, and I uh, pay very close attention to the Welsh setup when it comes to women's rugby. That's a very stark difference because we have regional rugby where it is barely played. Um, you have, so... Scarlets, Ospreys, Dragons, um, and Cardiff Blues yep. play against each other on these, like what you know, these uh, occasionally. But under 18s, under 21s, there's nothing, um, very, nothing, there's barely anything. It's, it's, there's not much competition at all. When you look, you know, at the club leagues, you have Swansea and Carnarvon absolutely smashing it every year. Swansea tend to win every year, regardless, but there's no competition. You basically have the Welsh squad playing in the same clubs. So there's no yep. competition. Scotland and Ireland, we see similar things where like um, there, there's one team that's just dominant and that's a real problem. So Tyrrells kind of allows this kind of competition between teams with different draws for players, whether it's money, facilities, access to what the men get, et cetera, et cetera. There's really, it, is, it is brilliant for professionalisation in that sense. So yeah. It's fantastic, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's fantastic for professionalising women's rugby as a whole. It's a very good example uh, of almost best practice for Wales, Ireland and Scotland to follow. So it does set a good template, but it's also destructive to them at the moment. Yeah, it, it, it is absolutely a good template. And I would love to see something similar in the other countries, but we... We, d we don't see it yet because we just don't have the investment from the unions. Is obviously the, the RFU support the Tyrrells Premier 15 so much. We, we don't see the same investment. And, you know, Wales, for example, have had years to kind of provide similar investment and they absolutely haven't. So, yeah, they won't. So, yeah, it just, it's on those things. It will happen. It won't happen for a long time. If you, if you had to predict what, what, how long we're going to, and would you even say that we're going to see a, a, a pro 14 or is it, is it going to be, it's going to be some sort of other fuse? Cause it, the way you were, the way you were describing it, it reminded me of, um, wide mates playing for Scarlets in the 16s growing up and stuff. Cause I, you know, I grew up in Wales and, uh, they, when they would play, face the other side, it was like that it was more sporadic and you would face Ospreys, Cardiff, um, and dragons, you know, you'd face them sort of randomly, then it'd be cancelled, and then they'd play them like a, you know, it was no, there was some sort of table format to it, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't like a, a proper league or anything. Yeah, I guess that's what the the women's is is kind of like. They normally have these kind of big days uh, in the summer where the four regions play each other, and they do have fixtures throughout the year. But yeah, um, it kind of it it it's almost almost a bit redundant because you have the big clubs in Wales as I say like kind of Swansea, Carnarvon, Carnarvon up north they um they you know if they play each other then essentially that's the that's the biggest game of the the season you don't really like it's very hard to explain I've just I can almost feel the looks from people who are in friends if you play for these sides but um <laughs> it's, all, it's all in South Wales as well in uh, those kind of re that those regions are all in South Wales so players in RGC, that kind of area, anywhere in North Wales, can't yeah. play regularly for these regions. So there are, there are a number of reasons why it just does not work at the moment in Wales. I can't comment so much on Scotland and Ireland, um, but yeah, it's not working. It, there are some amazing players up north, amazing players down south. If it was working at the same level that the Premier 15s are, people would watch. It is, it is very good rugby. Is it a fact that there's just not enough money right now to to start it up, or or is that is is that is that getting to territories that you'd rather not comment on? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I always say I go to the Welsh Rugby Union Christmas parties. I enjoy them too much to to say too much, but um, they <laughs> Wales, Wales have said they won't fund. They they're not putting money into it. I mean, like yeah, it's not great. There are some really dodgy kind of like Ryan Jones. The he's Ex Wales player, yeah, and I know, yeah, I know director. yeah, you know, um, he suggested that Wales women don't even need a head coach because we're sharing so much with, you know, they're sharing so much with the men, 
and he didn't mean it in a negative way at all I'm sure like he's so supportive of women's rugby but it's that kind of almost ignorance towards the, how the women's game is structured that you don't think there needs to be someone at the head of women's rugby in Wales that is just bizarre. How did he like can you can you say that again and describe it because I I can't see him look I'm no I'm no saint by the way but I can't see myself in a situation saying they don't need a coach how, how did he and I know Ryan he's a really really nice guy I was on the Welsh Rugby Union youth board um really really nice guy I, I can't yeah so I, I know you said that but how, how, what did he say and how, how did he say that and, and what did he mean right I don't really want to misquote him but essentially he suggested that because women's rugby is moving so in line with the men's that the potentially the, the Wales national side could just kind of have coaches that work with the men's I think it's it was he's been um it, this has been quoted and taken out of context by many and I really don't want to do that but he was essentially suggesting that Wales don't need a head coach. So he, he's already been attacked online for this. This has already yeah. happened. He but has. And I don't know, I don't know if it's, if he... By, by, by way, when I said good then, I meant in the sense that I don't want to be the one that gets him in trouble because he's a really nice guy. Um, so all I'm saying is good, Ryan. You've already, you know, you've already taken the hit. It's not going to happen again now, hopefully. Yeah. There are people within Wales, women, who really want to see growth in the sport. Um, I think that in a media perspective, they are being able to be much more in the media recently since Shuan became captain of Wales. It's, it seemed like she's everywhere now. She's on, she's, she was on in for a penny with Stephen Mulhern the other night. It was a complete shock. She's, you know, we are seeing, we're seeing more interest in Wales in women's rugby, which is massive. Whether they, I don't think they will fund women's women's rugby in Wales for a while. They they're increasing the budgets after coronavirus. We know that. We know that Wales are saying we are going to put money towards this. We're not going to let the women's team sink. Whether they actually invest in some, you know, structural massive change, I highly highly doubt. But then we're in mad times of coronavirus, and it is a chance to hit the reset button. If they do, I'll be the first to support them. But I cannot imagine they're going to do it anytime soon so I, I was just about to ask you on that but also i can see the time has been we've actually been on quite a while already is there any time limit with you or are you relaxed you can stay for however yeah, long no, I'm relaxed. yeah fine all right cool cool um no i was gonna say so you know the female professional game i imagine before coronavirus it's not exactly raining in cash um mm. how is it going to be responding post covid uh, in that sense, because like the whole of the game, rugby-wise, is going to be struggling post-COVID. Um, so I, I imagine that's just going to hit the female game harder. It, or, or, is that, or is that wrong? As you say, is it a time to reset and, you know, okay, right, our budget's this. We're going to push more towards the women's game so that they could actually come out of it better. Oh, yeah. No, I, I firmly believe that the coronavirus can see a a better time for um for women's rugby than we've seen so far it is a chance to click the reset button we might see the six nations move in the calendar which which could be very um financially beneficial for women's rugby um yes we were seeing this massive growth before coronavirus hit with this year's six nations so many people watching it um the we we will see that growth come again it might be halted but it also does give us the chance as you say to stop and rethink how are we presenting women's rugby here what do we need to do to grow it and I think that that is happening with with all unions I think that they, they are genuinely using this at, as, at a time to think right what we what we're going to do so and we've seen that like the only union that I have any kind of insight into through um the, the actual you know the women's rugby players is Wales and, and England and they both seem to be thinking right let you know with England let's continue let's build the clubs up in, in the um, Premier 15s let's make sure that our players are all paid and in Wales it's actually yeah let's add let's add value to women's rugby let's fund it so I'm hoping that Scotland and Ireland are the same I'm assuming I'm assuming Scotland at least are because they're kind of miles ahead of Wales already um Ireland are the only one I don't know about I don't know what they're doing but I would hope that they're kind of uh, pushing forward for another leap after coronavirus too how, how are Scotland then how have they uh, done more progress than Wales yeah, so yeah, Scotland, on that. yeah so so Scotland um they fund a couple of players so it's 
there are two players who are funded by Scotland. That's Jade Conkle and Chloe Rolley, who play for Harlequins as well. Um, so they get funding from them. There's Scotland have just kind of been looking at these part-time contracts. So they're called EPS contracts with yeah. players. Yes, the part-time arrangement so that you can work and play rugby and be paid for both. So they are looking at that too. That isn't something that, as far as I know, Ireland or Wales are looking into. But obviously England do have both EPS, which is part-time agreements, and full-time contracts. Okay, so there, there, there's just been further progress in that sort of thing compared to Wales from Scotland's end. Uh, and then we yeah. have no idea about Ireland. <laughs> no, I, I, honestly, what I, are they I doing really, over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really don't. I think they kind of, uh, yeah, Ireland are quite a funny one because they, they don't seem to... They, they don't seem to want to progress the women's game as much. I, as I have got questions on that, um, and I, I will ask them. But I was also going to say earlier, in the sense of... Um, I have totally forgot to ask you, and you mentioned it there, moving the Six Nations uh, away from the men's. Because from what I can see happens is it's on the same time, and then you watch, you know, I, I watch every man's match, uh, men's games, and then, uh, you know, there's 20s as well, and there's women's games. And I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm like, how many do I do I need to watch? It must be the same for you as well. If you want to watch every single one, it's like six matches over a weekend. Um, you know, I, I can imagine it'd be better for the women's game if it was on a different time period because then you got you know you're not competing with the one that's bigger. Yeah, I mean, um, it does absolutely depend. You do have to kind of be a, a diehard women's rugby fan to watch all of the women's games and the men's games. But um, it is, that is, you? Actually, is, is that you or not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 100% me. Um, I think the, the main argument is that if we get a new, a new window for the Women's Six Nations, then we'll, we might attract a, a headline sponsor and therefore prize money that we don't currently have. The men get a £60 million prize money pot. We don't get any, I say we, women's rugby doesn't get that. Um, we know that the, the women's tournaments can have a standalone audience. The Women's uh, World Cup in 2017 had 2.6 million viewers on ITV as a standalone competition. So it was, it, we, we know that women's rugby can stand on its own two feet and attract big crowds. Yep. You do have the problem at the minute where because we're trying to force the games into very short periods before the men starts, we have games that kick off kind of half an hour uh, difference between each each one so you watch one game then half an hour into that you're the the next one starts and you're having to then try and watch both and that's really not great it's not fun what, what why why is that to be honest i think it's kind of what stadium what you know are we going to have stadiums that are near the men's games so we then get to kind of make sure they're close to each other you know it's it's there i, I don't really know but it means that you can't, it, they, it's like the TV and the unions, whatever, don't actually think people want to watch women's rugby on its own. They see it as they just want to watch a bit of women's rugby. And when you actually want to watch both games, you end up having to... Oh, that's them. annoying. Is it, is it in the sense of that the company or whoever the broadcast has gone right? Well, I'm sure that people would rather watch Antiques Roadshow uh, you know, best clips than the women's game, and then they, and, and then that's why they're on all at the same time because they've 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 chosen other content basically over the game. I don't understand though. Why did they just play? Yeah. Have, I don't get it. I don't get it. If I'm being honest. I don't. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It, there's there is another problem uh, that I just want to expand on that that women are obviously mostly amateur who are playing in the Six Nations. The the majority of them have full time jobs elsewhere. And that's where their income comes from. Uh, with it being, you know, you moving it isn't going to make that much difference. But a lot of women play sevens as well as fifteens, and sevens there are sometimes money where there isn't in fifteens. Yeah. So we need to make sure that it doesn't coincide with or has the potential to clash with the Olympics or summer sevens tournaments. So I think we'd end up seeing it if it was going to be anywhere. It would probably be kind of I think <coughs> maybe. September, October time, so that you don't clash with the the spring internationals, so the spring summer internationals, autumn internationals. Um, kind of, if you move it later in the year from the Six Nations, you're kind of edging on where um, the finales of the the men's competitions get to as well. Yeah, I think if you want it to really stand alone, it needs to. I would, if if it were down to me, it'd be September, October, fresh from sevens, but with enough time to to recover. 
I guess that's a good time, apart from when there's a not not being a douchebag, by the way. <laughs> when, when there's a men's World Cup on, I mean that that, that, yeah. that but but that's only once every four years. I mean you you can deal with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it could be changed to to kind of fit around that for sure. Um, yeah, you couldn't have it at the same time as the World Cup. It's one of those things, isn't it? Where do you put it? But uh, we know that the World Rugby calendar is changing and drastically. So we it should be put somewhere where it's where it's good, and I'm I'm sure they'll consult with with women's players beforehand on what the right time is. They'll know about sevens. They'll know all of this. If it's a great idea, moving it, it might well be. There are people that say, well, actually, I like watching the women's game and watching men's games at the same time. It feels like you you get a whole rugby day when you get to watch all these games. But then there are a lot of people that watch the men's games and think oh, that's enough rugby for me so yeah, yeah. It's, it's how it's how i think financially it'd be better if they moved it and i think that is what i mean yeah it, it seems that money makes the world go around so i mean that that's probably going to be i imagine that'd be the decision whatever whatever's gonna because if, if they get a i don't know what, what you know you call it a, you know, a guinness six nations for the women as well it then that, how much you know that brings so much more money to the table which is which can be shared, which is which, which help, which would help the game grow and also look after the game. Yeah, I mean, we fa- women's rugby's failed to get a title sponsor for the Six Nations so far. Um, maybe if it stands alone, there would be that opportunity for sure. Um, I was going to say with the RFU, they've set aside cash. Um, obviously, what like in the coronavirus um, for for their female players and obviously the ones on part time deals that we were talking about as well. It, is the way the RFU have sort of responded to, to this crisis so we're a good template for other unions to sort of, you know, this is how we should act when, when we start paying our players? Is it, you know, is, is it good to see the RFU prioritising them and making sure that they're not... Because you know, they could easily gone, which I don't think they could actually in the, in the modern era, just gone, we need to save, we need, you know, we need to save costs. We're just not going to, you know, t- for a month, no pay or something, but that they haven't even thought about doing that. I mean, I guess it's it's how you look at it because essentially for for twenty eight uh, women's rugby players in England, that is their income. The RFU are their employer. It's kind of not amazing that they've decided to pay them. It costs <laughs> it, the total um, the total cost of the women's the women's wages for the England team is eight hundred grand. In the grand scheme of things, it's not an insane amount of money and it is people's income. None of them are being paid a fortune. The most is about 30 grand. It ranges for the full-time players between 24 and 30 grand. So it's not a humongous earning that these women are getting. What What is nice is that the RFU have kind of ring fenced the Premier 15 so that every club gets uh, 80 grand in, in cash to help coaching, S&C, medical costs. That's really nice to see. I think that shows that we are supporting our domestic league because we understand that that's where the standard is is risen to a point that we are kind of leading the way and being the the world's, you know, one of the world's best countries for rugby. So, so for you, the RFU, that they're doing a good job uh, in in this time. Then uh, it, with, with dealing with the whole situation, they they are. The only thing I would say is uh, the RFU have said that they are set to lose up to uh, 107 million pounds if the autumn internationals don't go ahead and um, they, they have said they have to follow the money and that they they're not guaranteeing investment into the women's game in the future but yeah so you kind of can't blame them when you think of the, the the grand scheme of things we really we really want to support the rfu here they are saying we are supporting women's rugby now. We will continue. We're doing everything we can, but we're not guaranteeing kind of like a matched investment in the future. Is that can you can you be understanding of that um, as a, as, a, as a female fan because of the obviously economic damage from this is going to be pretty severe and you, mm. it, it's it's probably not going to be a time to invest in stuff where you know there's not going to be probably financially a an instant comeback in um, compared compared to the autumn internationals that you know. Oh, they'd be going ahead anyway, wouldn't they? But you know, you sort of, do you get my overriding point there or not? Yeah, no, I do, and you you can absolutely understand it, can't you? They have to follow the money, but I do think they see that the growth in rugby and is coming from kind of the women and girls games. They they are very keen to to protect that as much as they can. They're kind of future proofing themselves a bit by um, by um, what's it called? investing in women's rugby. So I can, I can very much understand it from a financial position. 
Yeah, and I was um, going back to Ireland we were talking about earlier. The ex-Ireland player in 2013 Grand Slam winner, Jenny Murphy. So their lack of support since their Grand Slam win uh, is disappointing. And basically said there's been progress. But basically, like, the pro- they've had progress since 2013, since Ireland won the Grand Slam. But it's been at basically a snail's pace. Um, I mean, I-, I could ask you why that is, and you might not know. But in the sense of, you know, why do you think Irish rugby, you know, they, they seem a pretty progressive union in uh, but why, why haven't you know? Why haven't they really made hit hit the hammer basically in the sense that say maybe England have? Um, I mean, maybe England got more finances. But if you win the Grand Slam in twenty thirteen, do you think you want to push on uh, when you got a good thing going on? Well, I think this is definitely kind of an Irish fault here. They so Ireland went on to host the World Cup in twenty seventeen, but they completely failed to capitalise on the success of the Grand Slam. And in the next four years leading up to the the World Cup there was an investment, there were not facilities for women's rugby, there wasn't that kind of um, support for the women's game domestically or for the, for the national side. So they, they, they uh, got kicked out, I, I can't remember, like group stages. It was very kind of early doors that Ireland got kicked out. They, I would not say that they... Um, Are they progressive? Ca- they're not progressive. I think that it's kind of like if the Irish women's side do well, it's seen as like a bonus to the um, Irish rugby union. I'm not, yeah, uh, it's a difficult one. I, 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 I don't know what um, what's happening in Ireland, but it just does not seem to have that kind of same, that same kind of progress that we see uh, in- or Urgency in about what's going on? Definitely not as much urgency. They're, they're losing players as well, because players are coming over to England. They're training, they're, they're, they're playing, they're working in England. Um, and that means that playing for Ireland, training for Ireland is therefore that bit harder. Ireland train in, well, they did train last year. I'm not sure if it's still the same. They train in London. They train at uh, Wasps Old Ground. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm wrong there. Sorry. Um, I was, what I meant, sorry, that a lot of the Irish players have come over to play for Wasps. Sorry, a bit confused. And they, and they, and they play at Wasps Old Ground. Sorry, yes, yeah, so they play. Yeah. They play at Wasps, so they were coming over and playing there, which meant that a lot of the Irish players who were playing at Wasps couldn't then fly back for training and stuff like that. Or they did. It was um, so. Yeah, sorry, I inter- uh, spoke to a couple of players at the Wasps training ground that played for Ireland. And it was about Ireland, so I got a bit confused there. But yeah, it's there just doesn't seem that level of um, urgency or understanding of where the game is going for sure. Because you think you know you, you're hosting the World Cup. Let's spend the next four years growing, making sure that we're having, you know, brilliant facilities, brilliant um, level of play standard. And just it just slipped. And that our team's competitive. Like, you know, it's like with Japan, with the, um, the, men, the men's game. They had a great win in 2015 against South Africa, where the world end. If you're a rugby fan, that was the best thing I've ever seen. Um, I'm sure you, you might agree. I don't know. Um, and then obviously they had four years then, right, let's get a serious team together and actually compete with teams. And then they, you know, they, and the hosting World Cup did a great job and they actually beat Scotland and Ireland, two, you know, bloody good nations in the group stage. You know, they, they made sure they were coming to that tournament in a state where we're, you know, we're not going to be embarrassed at home. It, would you say that, like, that same urgency just didn't see? Obviously, the, again, it is the men's game, but Japan compared to the rest of the sides were probably in a position that Ireland were to maybe New Zealand or England, the women's game. Yeah, no, that is a really good comparison. Um, absolutely, Japan. That 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 Japan Scotland game was my favourite game of the World Cup. It was just <laughs> fantastic. Um, and I think that's the that's yeah. We didn't see that with Ireland. Ireland didn't have that kind of sense of urgency, and that is not the players' fault at all. So much of this is when I say Ireland, I'm kind of criticising the. The union, yeah. you know, the players are fantastic, and they, they all, you know, especially when I talk about Wales and Ireland, like you have to remember that these are full time pe- people who have full time jobs. This isn't um, professional rugby players. That's why you, you know, you can't so much compare with um, other nations, the men's uh, rugby. But these are women who have full time jobs, are training after full time jobs, as I said before, and then trying to train and for a World Cup. It's difficult if you don't have the support of your union. How are you meant to try and juggle with that? Well, yeah, I, it, it's 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 really tough. Um, it's really tough. I think the Japan rugby they started out. I'll be wrong, but I heard this from a journalist I met. Um, 
in, in the World Cup, because I, I work as a reporter out there, he said that the beginning, when Japan Rugby was trying to get more money into it, they had contracts where they'd give someone a job at a company, and then they, <laughs> and then they would... Uh, they sort of get most of their salary from that, but then they'd play rugby as well. But the job would be built around the rugby. So they would have like, they would come into work maybe at 10 a.m. after doing a morning weight session with the rest of the team and stuff like that. You know, they, I, I, that's how they started. I, I, I don't, and now I, I imagine you've got like guys like Matashima and uh, Shotohori and um, who's the other guy I love? Kazuki Himeno, that flanker. He was awesome as well. Um, imagine they're not, imagine they're, they're fully professional now and that's what they do full time. But in the beginning, that's, they made it work mm. that's kind of similar to what England had so they had a few players who were working for the RFU um very kind of yeah not quite sure what they were doing but kind of going around coaching and stuff like that yeah. so that they could kind of prioritize rugby when that when they needed to well that's good so yeah there we go so it's um your structure of your job then goes more aligned then to to, to basically playing the, the sport and what you want to do mo- with most of your time. That, that, that doesn't make sense. So I, was, I, I think I was right with Japan. It was so weird. I think you had someone like, I shouldn't say weird, but it was different. That you had, I think they, they would offer them jobs at like Toyota, <laughs> like, like Japanese like car makes, you know? And then like, um, and, and, then, and then you'd work that, wait, are, to- are Toyota Japanese? I think so, yeah. And, oh, if they're not, we're going to sound awful. But I think they are. I yeah. really hope they are. I'm actually, you know what? I'm actually the internet is. Uh, uh, I'm actually going to check right now because I am not. I am not <laughs> saying Toyota are Japanese and they're not. And they are. They are Japanese. There we go. Yeah, uh, yeah, there we are. yeah I could. I couldn't have we'll that. I could, another day. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have that. That that because that that one little thing would be found and you know compounded. Um, yeah, they'd often jobs with like Toyota and then you would do rugby in the, in the, in the evenings and mornings and then that, that and they, they would pay a salary. Like that's how they'd work it. Um, don't know if that's still going on now, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah. you know, and I, I think the working culture out there is way more intense than the, than Europe and the UK and stuff. I think they'd work them like, cause they're working hours like a longer in Japan in general. So it must've been quite tough though to like, to be a, a rugby player and work at, like a corporate job at the same time. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I just, every time I remember uh, when I was in my final year of my master's, I had um, Shuan as the head coach of the women's side and seeing yeah. her kind of work all day and being kind of, you know, she would literally like, she'd probably kill me for saying this, like, cause she's such a hard worker, but she'd be up at, she'd be at the uni at like six, seven with the, the women's team going through kind of, the, their strength and conditioning mm. she'd work all day at the university she'd might she might she'd train in the evening and she would do that day in day out and then she'd play for Wales on the weekend and you used to kind of see her around and just be like just want to give her the biggest hug but she's not like that kind of person really <laughs> she's like, just such are you a, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She just, you know, when you get to be around people like that, I think you realise the commitment and the the training and the sacrifices, really the sacrifices that that are that you need to play women's rugby at an, an international level. And I think in many ways, I would say that it's almost a bigger commitment than the men get the men have to make because the men get paid. Um, they don't have to work full time jobs. They don't have to think about maybe I don't have kids for another year or two because I want to play rugby. They don't have those considerations, um, whereas women do, and that's yeah. that's a, a massive thing. But it's, it's, it's bloody tough going. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the, the, we haven't even come on to you know being a female yet and having you know, for example, you know, I need to have kids in the next few years, otherwise it could be potentially be a bit harder. But I want to play rugby. I mean, that's a whole, oh, yeah. oh, that's a whole other discussion, isn't it? Yeah, and that's a massive thing. Like, I know women who go on to the contraceptive pill, even though it's bad for their mental health, because they want to control when their periods are so that they can control that around their rugby. I know women who think, well, no, I, I don't want to have children because of this. I know women who are genuinely, this, this is true, I know one girl who... Um, had a miscarriage and she blamed it on the rugby because she did she you know she was like well, well is it because my you know is it because I played rugby did that you know she wasn't playing while she was pregnant um oh, I, I, yeah for a second I thought that oh, yeah. oh god I know like... the way I said it was awful wasn't it but no she was pregnant stopped playing rugby and she missed she had a miscarriage and it's that kind of thing of like well 
it's so you have to think of all these things what are you put in your body through um how is it going to impact your future you know you're never going to be paid to play rugby so it's that that kind of you have to weigh up how far you want to commit how much you want to give because the sport will take everything from you and it, it will give you back memories honors respect but it won't give you money for a lot of women <laughs> And that's what you, and that's what you need to live as well. You know, that's that's the thing. I've got friends who play professional. Um, it looks pretty fun. You know, you you play rugby. You're a young. You're a young man. You they pay you pretty. If you're at a decent level, they pay you handsomely. And then you can, you know, as long as you do what they want you to do, then you got the rest of it. Your free time, and you still get a, they still get a bunch of holidays a year, like you do with any other job, um, full time contract job. You know, so it's so much harder for the women's game. I think you've got to have a real love, um, a real love and passion for it. Because what you said, you're your friend was doing there i mean that is i mean that's seriously intense um and i think you can only work long hours to that extent consistently if you really love something Other, otherwise you, you would just stop doing it after a while wouldn't you yeah i think that's the thing um and i've spoken about Shu a lot um but she she kind of for me kind of epitomizes what playing women's rugby is all about um she you know working ridiculous hours still managing to trade still managing to play still managing to coach you know she would coach as well that's the thing it's just Crazy. absolutely insane yeah and she got made captain uh, last or oh, was it last year or this year very recently anyway and it has just been the best appointment of captain she's just everything you'd want a captain to be and yeah it's been it, yeah it's it's very nice when you see that kind of passion De no De one deserving I think. as well so deserving yeah i mean she she challenges alwyn jones for being the most passionate welsh person on a rugby pitch <laughs> that's saying something as well yeah insanely passionate and just yeah lovely i, I was I, I my next question actually was on the um actually was talking about uh the, the i guess the the hard stuff you've got to go through to be a female rugby player it's quite it's quite long because there is a list i got off the internet as well it's um yeah so Hold, hold with me for this one it was um i saw so it was basically in a recent six, Na uh, six nations i know wales had freezing showers post-match and i know that new story blew up uh after the loss to ireland uh obviously this isn't good enough um and this though along with female players saying there's other challenges they face on the regular as well so not just freezing showers and the list is a lack of sanitary bins and changing room bathrooms dingy and shabby and sometimes dirty changing rooms partly because women's matches are often played in older venues, being given only two shirts for the duration of the Six Nations, getting the wrong size shirts because of a shortage, being given men's tracksuits, which they find, I shouldn't laugh, which they find uncomfortable as they're not cut for a woman's bust or hips, um, remarks on their use of makeup in performance reviews, what the hell, um, a lower standard of food provision, than their male counterparts. I can believe that as well. And so I was just going to ask you, I mean, I imagine this alone would make you as a young woman not want to play, knowing even if you make it, you have to face these challenges too. Is that, is that fair to say? I mean, that is a bit, I know I've asked you a big question there, so I'll just step back. <laughs> um, well, I guess, would it, would it stop a young woman playing? Probably not. Um, you play because you want to play rugby and you know that, you know, from a grassroots level growing up, you know that, that rugby clubs are never beautiful places to have a shower no. and get changed but um i think yeah it's, it's absolutely not good enough and i think what you say about a lack of sanitary bins so this list that you've um that you just read out that i think that comes from kate rowan who's a, a journalist at the telegraph she it kind of does did, yep. yeah she's she's incredible she did this um basically expose almost piece of what is so wrong with women's rugby and the facilities that women get and international level and it's shocking, like even if you're aware of like that things aren't good enough, you know, two shirts for a six na for the entirety of Six Nations is awful. You could at least have one a match, shouldn't you? Yeah, and some so I think Wales are now providing six per tournament and things have changed because of uh, Kate's piece. Okay. Um but essentially the shirts don't fit. Um you can see if you notice like in, in when England play, they all look like like absolute models and they've got the, the 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 fit is perfect the shorts are cut perfectly and then you see other nations and you're just like well it just looks like they've drugged whatever shirt they could find out the kit bag some of them are far too tight some of them you see women like having to yank their shorts down all the time because yeah. they're wearing men's shorts i think if we look from a kit perspective 
you need you need bigger shirts than men because women have boobs you need better shorts because women have bums um whoever decided to play in white shorts is was not a woman because that, that was I, how do i forget to put that in damn it i saw that in the list oh, yeah that's terrible yeah because sure. women women have periods and uh, I, uh, probably near a quarter of women playing in every match are on their period no woman on this earth would want to be wearing white shorts when they're on their period just in case especially when you're rolling around in mud and in uncomfortable positions constantly you just would not want to so that was a decision made by a man 100 percent and the lack of sanitary bins and stuff like that is just just shows like this kind of problem that we have with women in sport around periods because we just don't want to talk about them the stuff about um exactly because there's men executives who don't want to talk about them I think that's true. I think as well, it's that maybe, maybe, you know, what you said earlier about um, not feeling comfortable around a male coach, maybe that does come into play here that actually if you are on your period and there is no bin in the changing rooms, you would then feel uncomfortable going to your coach and saying, can, you know, what are we meant to do? Yeah. Because he, he might not know. And it's just, it is those, those kind of uncomfortable conversations. Um, I mean, there's a whole other discussion. There's a whole other thing about how little we talk about periods in women's sport and how much we absolutely should because it's... Is, is that more a wider society thing, though? Or is that, or, or, like, as in, you know, like men not being comfortable around periods in the sense, or, or is it is that just gone into rugby or is it a rugby thing? I, I, I think it's probably a wider society thing, isn't it? It wouldn't just yeah, be it's rugby. A sport, it's a sport thing. And in fact, um, I sound like I, I, I work for the Telegraph. I don't. But the Telegraph have just done a, a study on, or they've they've just reported on it. I think they contributed to it I've around how, yeah, how periods are in how they're treated in women's sports, and essentially they're seen as this taboo subject that we don't want to talk about. Yet it's such a massive thing, and it can really affect performance uh, in a, in a massive way. It can affect how you train, how you eat, how you sleep, how you know. I, I'm, it's it's impossible really for. Um, for a man to understand and that's just the way it is i'm sure they can sympathize and everything but it is difficult to explain some days you, you know if especially when women have like these problems with their periods as well which is a lot of women it's impossible to play rugby it's just you know can, can i ask a personal question on that or not yeah would it what does it does it if you if you're on your period does that affect are you going to play worse does that affect your performance uh, I mean, personally, yeah, it's the it's the worst thing in the world being hit, being tackled when you're on your period because it just feels like pain like no other. <laughs> but, um, well, but I was about yeah. to say, I can imagine, I can't. Um, <laughs> no, but but you can sympathise. It's yes, not I can sympathise. Yeah, I can't imagine because I'm not a female. But <laughs> yeah, and I think at a professional level, when that kind of dictates if you're going to be playing the week after or if. You know, for some women, if, if you're going to be, uh, your, your contract's going to be continued. It's a very difficult thing that we do need to talk about more, for sure. And it links into the whole thing about um, women having kids and going back to rugby, because there are a whole host of problems there that we don't like to talk about either, about after women have children and how their bodies change and how certain things are more difficult to keep in than they were before you had kids and stuff like that. It's, yep. There are loads of physical changes that with women or physical problems that we don't talk about enough. Um, and I would love to talk about it more. But what you were saying about them, the, the stuff in the changing rooms, all of that, those freezing cold showers were not good enough. Ireland say it was just a mistake and because it was so cold, there was a storm. You take, you, t you probably, you wouldn't, you, you want to say that's, that's true. I doubt they did it with any malicious intent because the players are quite good friends off the pitch and it wouldn't have been done, I don't think, because of anything like that. Yeah. The track suits is a real problem because like, I tried to buy a pair of the, um, the Wales tracksuit bottoms and they are literally just the, like, they're just not made for a woman at all. You just, I could not get them on. I'd be arrested if I wore them out the house. They were that bad. <laughs> but, the, you know, England now have shorts for women. Wales have shorts for women. We're seeing kind of progress there. Um, but yeah, just if I could find the person or the people who decided to put white shorts on women, you just get them, get them, hung, <laughs> get them hung, drawn, and quartered. Yeah, whoever that man is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, even I could think. I, I like the. I mean, maybe I've got the benefit of hindsight. I'm trying to think if I'm like right, you know, females need shorts. Yeah, I'm not going to make them white. You know, I, I don't. I 
I like to think I wouldn't make them white. Maybe I would. I don't know. You know, like now I know. Obviously, I wouldn't, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. And would you would you uh, would you think that they would need more room in them because women have bigger bums normally than men, and they have bigger hips, and actually where they sit on your hip, they need to be a bit longer because women have to wear their shorts on their waistband normally, not around their hips like men do. We wear them yeah. higher up. I mean, yeah. um, my boyfriend can't believe when he's, he when I have my shorts so high up, he's like pull them down I'm like no because they have to sit if they sit on my hips it's gonna I'm gonna look like a sausage roll like they need to sit <laughs> on my waist otherwise I can't run so it's those kind of things like um it's good to have kit that's designed um for women and for women's bodies probably would be better to have a, a female design it and and, and she, you know you know make sure it's made custom made for for women I imagine that like, I, that, that, how could that not have happened though i don't yeah they i mean they order the kits years in advance sometimes for the women's teams they don't even know the size of the teams that they're ordering it for they just buy like a certain number of sizes which is why you sometimes see props in very tight tops and um <laughs> oh, you know wingers and these like really baggy tops it just it's just one of those really unfortunate things that yeah. we need to work on and thank god like um the unions do seem to be working towards for sure yeah, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, I, I really enjoy that discussion. I'm, tr I'm trying to think. Um, anything else is going to ask on it? No, I think that's it. I, I think. Well, and any other issues in that sense of, of being a, a female player when it? Cause you, you said you said you could carry on on the uh, the period topic, but then, then I guess is, it, is there anything else you want to you mention about the? I, I get yeah. I guess it's your choice. I, th I think we do need to have a bigger conversation around how we treat women's rugby players, professionals who take maternity leave, do we accept that they need a, a longer maternity leave than, than uh, women who don't play rugby? Like, as in terms of from the, from the RFU, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as far as I'm aware, that's not something that's happened yet, but I, I may, may be wrong, but um, what do we do about that? How do we support women who are playing full-time rugby or playing for their country? How do we support them coming back um, after a pregnancy? How do we support women kind of manage... Um, issues that um, um, disproportionately, disproportionately affect women, so childcare being one. How do we support women with that? Um, how, do we, how do we track periods? So at the minute, uh, Wales have just launched um, a period tracking scheme. England have one, um, to be fair. Uh, how, 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 does, how does that work, a period tracking scheme? So women will just put where they are in their cycle. So they'll track their cycle and then coaching staff will be able to, with the player's permission, understand yeah. where they are. So that if a woman is um, on her period, she can, her co the coaches will know and therefore she'll be able to maybe sit out of a bit of contact or not run as much or... Um, yeah, let's, let's not do the square of death. Uh, while she's on <laughs> while she's on her worst day or something you know like. yeah it's that kind of thing and I think it's just having that more open discussion about um how how you react I mean one thing that um uh, people always say is if men had periods the world would be a different place and I think that's true um if we can have uh if we can if we can have these conversations that we are having and I think you know the vast majority of of us can be mature enough to talk about periods um and it not be this awful thing but yeah let's have that you know england are bringing in sanitary products in the changing rooms even if they don't know if any if, if they just have them in the change room at all times sanitary rooms are always provided Good. and they're visible and they're out so that we normalize this thing about having your period when you're playing rugby professional sport um i do think that if you if you got all players in a room and asked them to, who put your hand up if you want to play in white shorts you wouldn't have a single person with your ha with their hand up um but that's you know that that will probably change i think we will we should start to see sanitary products that are made for sports women because um you know if you're tackled and you're wearing a tampon it can it can fall out it can be painful it can be it can cause toxic shock syndrome um if you wear a sanitary towel it's not as protective white short problem again um and it's not comfortable we, we is, is there something on the market the um a sports designed tampon well if there is i want to know <laughs> and if there's not yeah, jess I'm, I'm open for a, a business venture with you i mean you have to deal with the day-to-day -day running of it because you know i've obviously got no experience with that <laughs> actually that's a lie i think i actually when i 
look at it, that sounds really weird. But when I was when I was thirteen, I my nose started bleeding in a game, and um, it, it wasn't a tampon, but it was a polystyrene sort of uh, how do you describe it? Almost tampon. Those things they shove up your nose. Yeah, yeah, you just shove that up my nose. Yeah, but I, I get, I get. That's not. Yeah, that's that. That's my only experience of polystyrene objects, and um, yeah, <laughs> and with blood. Well, I guess there is another use for tampons in women's rugby, which is often used, which is, um, I'm not a forward, so excuse my terminology, but you know the, the strapping around the, the thigh to lift? Yes. Well, one of my best friends worked out that if you, if you lined up tampons on your leg as you, as you put the tape over, mm. it provides a much better base to, to lift them because you can yep. fit them between your fingers. Oh, wow. Than it, yeah, than a bar, you know, the traditional kind of like, padding yeah um, so yeah we should also normalize the use of tampons in rugby so that more women can discover that trick because it works wonders if you're not if it's if it's rain if it's raining if it's slippy if you know the girl that you're trying to lift has moisturized her legs before a match and therefore it's impossible to lift her up <laughs> that kind of thing though yeah tampons in, on underneath the strapping is a top tip <laughs> so that, that's a way of getting marginal gains across your uh, your opponent to, to 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 try and get a one up on them. Yeah, I don't even know if it's legal. They'll probably. I would I'm say sure that's cheating. That. Um, I would say that's cheating. But I'm all I'm very game for uh, creating sports design tampons. Uh, yeah. Untouched market. Um, now now I've said that someone will someone will do it. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey Jeff, go you, you go for it. Um, yeah, I was gonna say um, I, I don't want to bang on about COVID. Uh, 19 too much um, but I was, I was just saying I was just gonna say like I was saying earlier with the the revenue hit that the men's game the men's game is gonna take and rugby's gonna take um, I know we, we were discussed with a female game it's been hit but how, how do you think rugby is gonna respond to this obviously Bill Beaumont uh, won the election um, and he talked about a array of topics a global calendar and all, all these other things is, is he because is he the man to trust and do what trust well rugby to sort of bounce back from this um, I mean obviously just the classic saying, what's everyone, what's everyone saying? Unprecedented times. <laughs> yeah, we are living in unprecedented times, truly. I, I do think the world, we are going to bounce back. Rugby isn't, isn't finished. I don't know when we will see it come back. Um, I mean... Well, the, well, pro sorry to interrupt, the problem is, is that it's so much more, like football, we obviously, we, it's, it's so much less touchy-feely than, 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 you know, than, than rugby, isn't it? It's, it's a lot less closer, you know, than con to contact. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't get much closer than a scrum, can you? I mean, there is no ability to social distance in a scrum. For, so, for bro, they're coughing all over you. They're breathing all over you. Yeah, you've got people spit blood, everything on, on you all the time. So absolutely, you do not want to have rugby back before it's absolutely safe and probably before we have a vaccine. Um, I mean, football, they've been trying to come back and it's just been a disaster, hasn't it? Because we're seeing um, more people... Um, you know, we've seen players, staff test positive for coronavirus after like, this like slow phase back into rugby. Um, one thing that I think is really important, I was chatting to um, Bobby, Paul Bobby Sturgeon, the uh, uh, British and Irish Lions uh, yes, strength yes, conditioning yes. coach, yeah, Wales strength conditioning coach, amazing guy, or head of performance, I think his title is, is incredible. Um, he was saying how basically he thinks that we will see this like stagger back into rugby that will be completely led by medicine and all the unions are completely for let's follow the science let's follow what the what their kind of head of medical whatever is saying and that's really important rugby will follow the science I'm sure um we we do need to be careful for the front rows I mean if we if they're in this like prolonged period of of rest um even if they are training at home even if they are lifting weights, it's that kind of rugby contact, rugby drills, um, rugby game time. How, you know, what is the progress going to be back into rugby? If we see, you know, they're saying like October, we're going to come back. We're going to see potentially like Six Nations or whatever, Oarsman Internationals. Yeah. Um, you've got then, you know, the Six Nations again, you've got the European, all the kind of men's domestic and international kind of competitions coming to a close next spring then you've got British and Irish Lions tour at what point like how are we going to prepare for any of that 
how is it going to be safe to do so? And are we even going to have a lion star at the end of this? Are we going to have any kind of... And will the players be ready to play a, a test series of that calibre when they haven't even had a decent, you know, not even eight... I, I think I saw coaches in the Premiership saying they need... Players need eight weeks of training to, to mm. even be ready for a, a match because obviously it's, it is that intense. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I, I asked Bobby that. I said, like, do you think that the tour will happen? Do you think that we'll have any kind of ability to bring players? Uh, players will be strong enough physically. Are we going to have loads of injuries before the Lions tour that we won't be able to have a Lions tour? And he said, basically, they get what they're given. They'll do the best they can. They work very closely with the unions. They work closely with the individual clubs of players they're interested in. Yeah, we might not be able to see, you know, like how before a Lions saw, you often get like one player who just plays exceptionally well um, in the Six Nations and then they get called up. There's that lovely kind of, you know, joy of that. We're not going to yeah. see that this, this uh, next year. We're not going to see it, um, which is a shame. You know, I hope the tour will go ahead. You know, maybe there are a lot of things in its way. There are a lot of things that have gone wrong so far for the Lions. There are a lot of things that will continue to go wrong. Um, but yeah, phase. if we have these phases of return, then I think we need to focus on, you know, getting the props in, getting the, the, the forwards in as quickly as possible. Backs are social distance by nature anyway, aren't they? We stand in. <laughs> But the you know I'm only joking, but yeah, we do need to be very careful on these kind of dominant positions in the in the pack, like making sure that they are game ready and that we don't suddenly see broken spines, broken necks, all of that as soon as we come back to rugby. Because okay, you can lift weights and you know you can stay good, in good strength and conditioning shape, but it's not the same as playing a match. It's absolutely not, and as well when you think when the players have been furloughed. Um, technically they're not really allowed to be doing any, you know, their job, when you're furloughed, you're not meant to be working at all. When your job is a rugby player, where do you distinguish what is just doing your own weight-based training and what is what is actually training? And I think the line is, blur, you know, that's when you're actually training with other people. <coughs> when you're training with people when there's contact, if players are to be continually furloughed for this longer period, we know that they're not going to be having any contact or any kind of rugby until at least kind of July, August. If they then start training August, September to play in October, that might be enough time. We don't know. If they don't start training until September, then they're expected to play in October. Simply not enough time. <laughs> no, it's fair. not. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's not enough time. It's, um, you know, you, you can't prepare for battle by being, you know, with not a lot of time. And also when you've been out of battle for ages, can you? You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. common sense, really. Um, I was going to ask you on the Lions. Have you, have you still got your Lions? Did you do, did you do a Lions 23? Did I, did I re-ask you that or not? I did. I wrote it down as well because it's been on my phone for ages. So I can quickly go through it if you want. Okay. okay. Well, what I'll do, I'll, I'll leave that last. I had a few more questions for you. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish on that. A bit of fun. I've done mine as well. So I'm sure we'll have some arguments over that. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, I, know, I know you've played rugby yourself, Jess. Uh, what, what position were you? Why are you? Uh, utility back. I play uh, outside Love centre. That. That's a, Elliot Daly. Of, I'm an Elliot Daly. I absolutely am, but not really. <laughs> not, yeah, not really a fullback. But um, I like playing outside centre the most. But I've played uh, played everywhere. Fly half, inside, outside centre. I've played on the wing quite a lot. Um, I've played one game at number eight because um, I had a seizure a few years ago from rugby um, okay. and I lost, lost the use of my legs and I was then when I came back to rugby I had to I was very weak mm. and I was very fat so because I'd put on so much weight since being injured so my first right. game back was at number eight and then when eventually they let me play winger again I realized I must have lost some weight <laughs> <laughs> so well, where's your favorite position uh, outside center for sure why just get on that sort of outside arcing run just sort of you, you like you like the spec you like the contact there as well though I guess because at 13 you, you can't avoid that yeah absolutely I think uh when you're when you're playing inside center you in women's rugby you crash ball all the time the ball you don't get to you don't get to run as much whereas I love when you're outside center you get to kind of um dictate and move a bit you can really run you can make yards but as soon as you've broken that defender you don't have to run any further because you've got a winger on your shoulder who you can pass the ball to so it's a nice position if you uh if you don't like if you don't like running too much but you like 
the contact you like breaking through contact which is definitely my favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> what you want you like the crack the contact area you enjoy that Jess yeah it's definitely my favorite part of the game which I think a, a few years ago I'd have said was my least favorite part of the game but now it's definitely my favorite that, that's funny I've gone the other way the, the older I've got it's more the thing I'm good at would be running away from people and dodging them and everyone's got bigger and I haven't really got bigger so it's like I can just avoid that area. I do enjoy it. I do enjoy contact area. Problem is, if I'm if a guy's six foot five and twenty stone, I'm like five eight, five seven, you know, twelve, twelve and a half stone. I'm just gonna get ragdolled. Yeah, especially when yeah. the mate comes in to help them as well. <laughs> like, yeah. See, yeah. I'm I'm quite big. I'm definitely a forward or a prop in disguise, but um I, yeah I'm uh, like if you had to put my size on a, a mat, like a men's pair and probably like two a laggy I'm that kind of for a, not in not in terms of skill in, woman, in women's of, context in, in, women's in terms of size okay, okay. <laughs> well, so you're, uh, you're, you're a ba battering ram Jess um yeah I'm a big back I'm a big back and I don't I don't mind being a big back because it's quite it does you know especially when you get to play like an easy game it's fun isn't it it's quite fun yeah but then it's not you know girls you know girls are, are still you know most women women's rugby players are around my size I'm not like I'm not massive I'm not tiny um but it is quite nice sometimes when you get that uneven um match yeah. and the, the girl opposite you is beautiful a lot smaller <laughs> Beautiful. That, yeah, that my university I played for wasn't as high level as I'd play to in college and stuff. And I was against one guy. It was he must have been five foot five and like ten stone on the wing. And I was like, mate, like I I usually want to run around you, but I might just run through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, total, total mismatch. I was going to ask, um, how do you get into rugby then? As like a passion, and like, uh, yeah, why do you keep coming back for more? Right. Um. So I, I guess it's, it's not like a romantic story, but I was, when I was in my first year at university, I just didn't really find people who I really wanted to be friends with. Like I didn't find anyone where I was like, that's my group. Basically, then, the, the, your, your, did, you, did you do halls? No, that's the problem. Because I went through clearing because I didn't do very well in my A-levels. I ended up um, having to live in a house. And the people yeah. I lived with were lovely, but they just weren't the people that, you know, they weren't like my best friends or, you know, so, you, you just didn't click? Didn't, well, yeah, well, we, we did, but I just needed a friendship group and they were all very separate people and I Got kind you. of really wanted a group. Yeah. Um, and I went to Freshers' Fair and I saw this girl who did a, a long arm pint so when you have to try and drink a pint with, like, without bending your arm and you just pour it all down yourself. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was so stupid that. I was about to ask, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, no, you literally just pour it. You have to try and get as much in your mouth as you can. And I saw her do that. And I thought, oh, that looks really fun. And so, like, I went over and they were rugby. And she's now, like, we're still really close friends, Clara. I mean, the other night we had a catch-up until about, four, we started at 8, finished at about 4 a.m. And we're still really close friends. And that's how I got into rugby was just that wanting that social side of things. Um, I'm very much a social player. I'm not someone who's ever going to be playing for England but I just love rugby so much I love playing it I love watching it and it then it became a professional thing um I did some some work experience at the Times the Sunday Times then the Times um and the Guardian I just got really into it that way and just tried to um do as much as I can and I went to the Guardian and they said oh do you want to go to Penny Hill Park to interview Johnny May and I was like yes <laughs> yes please <laughs> so um I got to do that and that would just kind of cemented this absolute love for rugby seeing the you know just seeing all the, the the coaching staff um seeing the players I was just like this is you know I don't I've never felt this passionate about something else in my life I love playing rugby I just love the game I love everything about it um so I decided to do my master's researching kind of the representation of women's rugby um and then I started kind of just writing about rugby speaking about rugby um and ever since then it's just kind of grown and it's it's absolutely my life I'm either um when I'm not injured because um I'm, I'm I'm very unfortunate but when I'm not injured I'm playing rugby then I'm writing about rugby I'm watching rugby you know I get to spend a lot of extra time with my dad because we go to rugby games together a lot yeah. and it's just lovely. Just everything about it, really. So you're, you're really, I guess, grateful that you've sort of stumbled across it in Freshers' Fair and it's now one of your main passions. 
Oh yeah, it's the it's. I always say it's like the best thing that ever happened to me because I found my sport. Um, I found something that would like actually, you know, build that passion in me where I was like, this is this is what I want to do. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's it, it helped me like it's helped my mental health like God, you know, ridiculous amounts. And I always I you know I know that rugby is a safe space for me. I know it's where I feel comfortable, and I think that's a really nice feeling to have. Would you describe it as a sort of anchor? So like yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, wherever I go, that rugby follows me. So um, I've moved between Wales and and London, like Essex, London. Um, in the past year, I've you know I've joined a rugby club then in Essex. I've got this new network of friends in a place where like because most because I'm from Essex, but most of my friends are now in different parts of the country or world. Yeah. Um, studying and working. Um, so to have like this new network of friends in, in my hometown has just been amazing. Um, just have it, yeah. It's just one of those things that you know once you once you're into rugby and once you've played or once you've just been involved that you can walk into any rugby club. And this sounds so cheesy, but you can walk into any rugby club in the world and know that you're amongst friends because you know that you share a genuine passion for a sport that doesn't have that many fans compared to football and you don't have that in football like you know there are fights if your team lose and you just don't have that in rugby and I think that's what's nice I mean I'm English my boyfriend's Welsh we go to England Wales games we watch England Wales games and we never fall out <laughs> so it's that kind of thing that's nice you just don't get that in other sports there, there's there's hardly um any trouble really uh at rugby. It, well there will be trouble but in comparison to football it's you can't it's so like it's worlds apart trouble wise yeah it's a lot safer as well like if you wanted to take kids to watch rugby you would feel a lot safer doing that than you'd feel taking them to a football match for it's, sure. it, it's, it's a good selling point as well for rugby really um if, in promotion of the sport you know that's a, i mean football doesn't need to grow because it's just, it's massive but for rugby it's definitely a good thing they can they can play on that i was gonna ask um if you've had any sort of overall would you say your experience is fully is positive uh, rugby is, is is there any negative parts that have, that have happened through it or not um the injuries are absolutely awful they're crushing like i um as i, I touched on before i had a, a really i had a seizure because i got punched in the face on the pitch i was carrying the ball in a mall so it li literally didn't even have my hands anywhere near her. it was not a fight but mm. she was punching me in the face to try and get me to drop the ball and um uh, i had a, a big seizure that night or the night after and um couldn't walk i just just like had so much damage in my legs because of the seizure the actual seizure not the brain injury that i couldn't get the strength to walk for for weeks and i think one well, month um and i was on like a zimmer frame i looked like an old lady and then um was able to walk again that was awful um but then did, it's just did, even did, did that put you off playing again it it did but then i did come back um, did, did, did she get in trouble for doing that? Like that's that. See, that doesn't happen that much in men. Like a women's game sounds a bit brutal at times and crazy. Like, like that sort of stuff doesn't happen that much in men's games. I mean, it does. Like men, men do punch each other on the pitch. They do stuff if the ref doesn't see. Not at professional level, grassroots level. It happens all the that, time. It, that, that that is true. That that is true. I, I, I guess the ending. I guess I guess for you, obviously, really unfortunate. The end result was worse, and I guess it usually is when it happens. In general, because you see clips of like referees getting knocked out in lower league matches and stuff, so obviously the stuff does happen. But um, it's pretty shocking though, like you know, to to hear about that happening. Yeah, it was bad. Like I've I've had I had a concussion the year before that was pretty bad, and I ended up getting a, a bruise on my brain. Um, so I've I'd you know I'd had a couple of bad bad head injuries, but I wanted to get back. Um, and I, you know, continued playing, then came home and I broke, um, just like silly things like you break a finger and when you're working full time job and you've broken your finger, it just makes life harder, you know, and, and yeah, yeah. But then most recently I kind of, uh, like dislocated my thumb or I, I, I'm not sure quite what happened, but it was very bad. It was this, this thumb. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't move it and I was in so much pain and for weeks I had to have like my arm in a sling to keep it still because I couldn't keep it still um and it's yeah it still hasn't healed and like it's just silly things like that when you actually have to work full time and play rugby those kind of things are bad um for sure the injuries I mean I've, there are people who've had it worse like touch wood I've never broken like a major bone from rugby but yeah. I can imagine it just be awful 
Um, in terms of like sexism, it doesn't really happen. Um, as for, like in my experience, I haven't found it in rugby as much as I have uh, in in football or like yeah. talking about other sport. I, I guess the only thing that's that's quite funny is sometimes um, in my work, like rugby players follow me. Um, and I had, I've had like a few rugby players kind of slide into my DMs and I'm like, you know, I'm a journalist. <laughs> like you really wait, 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 and what, obviously you don't, you don't need to, wait, wait, in, in the way of they're trying to chat you up. Yeah. But it, but like, my, you know, my, I'm a journalist and you, you, you know, that that's, that you're almost, you're almost kind of in my work circle because you follow, I follow you and you follow me because you're a rugby player and I'm a rugby journalist. And that sometimes is a bit I, weird. Then, I, I'm not going to ask you to say the names. Are they, are they professional? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's quite, that's the only bad thing. Hi, and I guess, high, well, so a high level or high, high level. I'm not saying, I'm not <laughs> okay. saying, but, um, but no, not, not, you know, not in a, it, that sounds really vain, but it does, that, that has happened a few times. Um, I've had like, you know, sometimes within, just within sports journalism, there are so many men and not many women. Um, and Same thing? Kind of similar thing, similar thing, but that, you know, you know, that's a problem for women everywhere. I would say that overwhelmingly rugby is a safe place for women to work, to play everything and much better than it is. You know, I know a lot of women who work in football journalism yeah. and they cannot say a thing without having... 10 people or 10 that'd be lucky hundreds of people in their in their dm sending them death threats because they've said the player hasn't had a good game you know it's ridiculous and i know that women's football journalists have it a lot worse than than rugby journalists do yeah the um the journalist broadcasters just get up yeah it's it's disgraceful actually and it's really really sad actually because it, it i i don't know I, I i don't know how i would respond to that you know, I, I, I don't know. You, you only know, I guess, when it happens. I, I, I guess I just wouldn't read them, but still, it's not, it's not right. No, and I guess it, though, it is fair to say that men get it uh, as bad in football journalism, for sure. I think when you're a woman, you, it's a bit scarier if there's a man sending you threats because you, yeah. you, know, you, know, you don't know when they're being serious and when they're not. Um, so, yeah, there, there are plenty of things that are bad with sports and women, but I would say in... The, you know in general it's a lot uh it's a lot better to be a, a woman in a woman in rugby than it is a woman in football like just for example just want to give an example yeah um i spoke to a player once and he asked if i wanted the door left open and stuff like that and it's just yeah. that awareness of you know i don't want you to feel uncomfortable that is really nice i think oh, he, oh yeah oh okay he he really took uh or courtesy there to to make sure you were comfortable just because of that relationship dynamic that you have when you're a journalist and you're interviewing a player they are you you know the player knows that you to some extent are very interested in them professionally and stuff like that and I think he was just aware that he I don't think he'd ever been interviewed by a woman before and he was just like Do you, you know shall I we'll leave the door open um, and he made quite a big thing, like he, he sat far away from me. And I think that kind of thing is appreciated. It's not always necessary. I didn't feel like it was. Um, but I think it, do, it goes a long way when, um, when you're a woman in, in a very male-dominated space for men to make it clear that you are absolutely safe. Did it, did, he make, did it make you feel more comfortable with him? Yeah, it made me feel like I could trust, trust him a bit more. And, you know, it's so nice as well when... Um, you get that kind of uh, support because I think a lot of a lot of men in in rugby journalism and rugby want women to succeed and they want women to kind of they. I love it when I chat to someone and they they are, you know they're they're surprised that I'm a woman or something you know it's just that thing it's it's actually quite nice and you know that people are sometimes extra supportive of you which might not be a good thing it's positive discrimination it depends what you think but. <laughs> Who want who really want you to do well, and that's that's lovely, I think. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, you, we don't. Yeah, I, I mean, it could be positive discrimination, uh, and I mean that's that's good for whoever's receiving it in a in a in a professional sense. Um, but but obviously, um, the, the person could just just be wanting you to do well, <laughs> can, yeah, couldn't they? And, and you happen to be a woman or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. It's, very, it's why it's so hard to tell if things are sexist or if things are just because a lot of people in rugby are nice people. <laughs> they are. It's. Is that is that is that is it's not, it's not just me, is it? I swear that 
rugby that that is why for me it might be my favorite sport because i love i love like uh, a bunch of other sports as well but it, the people the people rugby people like your your average joe rugby person they seem to be just be great great people in general yeah nicer yeah absolutely couldn't agree more yeah it's weird um okay well last thing and then i'll leave you have a life uh lions team you go first i'll go second um okay. Well, I don't, no, I'm going to get so much hate for this. It's been building for a few years. So, and I would also like to point out that consideration has been made that this might not be a perfect team in a while, but I'll go ahead anyway. So um, if I start with my forwards, loose head prop, Mako Vanapola, yeah. um, Jamie George Hooker, Furlong tight head prop, yeah. Locks Atoje and Alwyn Jones, yeah. blind side flanker, Tom Curry. Open side flanker Justin Tipperick, um, Badatow at number eight. Um, and then if we go to my backs, I'm going to do my replacements afterwards, but yeah, yeah. Um, my backs Colin Murray, scrum half, Finn Russell, fly half. Oh, what you have to, you have to go with, you have to go with at least some. Well, like, um, I've done mine, we'll, we'll debate, we'll debate. Okay, okay, so okay, Con- Connor Murray, scrum half, fly half, Finn Russell. Yep. Um, so my wingers are Anthony Watson and Johnny May. Inside centre Farrell, outside centre Tuolagi, full back Liam Williams. So you might see that Elliot Daly's been oh sorry, no, not Liam Williams, Stuart Hogg changed last minute. That was a last minute change. Okay. Hogg at full back. Um so my replacements are Elliot Daly because he did very much <laughs> uh deserves a place there. And I think that because he just did so well in the um uh 17 tour yeah having him so eight daily replacement jonathan davies jonathan davies sorry you have to have him um obviously star player last tour and wealth of experience um so for a fly half i've put as my replacement i've suggested that I don't think you need a replace. Sorry, I don't think you need a replacement for fly half because you've got Farrell, Elliot Daly is a, like kind of you can you know you can maybe put mix that round a bit and you can yeah. probably get away with that. Good point. Um, scrum half replacement. I put Reese Webb. I don't like him, but I'm going to put him in just because he has got experience. From... You, you don't like him as a person. Terrible bloke. Terrible bloke. Oh no. <laughs> I don't I'm joking. Know him. I've never met him. I, I, he's, never he's, met he's, him. Not, he's not your selection for the team. I'm only messing around. I don't like him as, I just don't see him as a team player. So, and I like this the, the stuff he was saying about like the, um, he was still the best scrum half in Wales. And I just, yeah, I just don't, don't think he's a nice bloke, but that's my opinion. Fair, um, fair play. You're so, I mean, I haven't got the balls to say that. He gave me a nice selfie when I had work experience there when I was 17. So I'm not going to say anything bad about him, but you go ahead. Yeah, no, I just think I just I've never met him, and you can't really say anything until you've met someone. But it doesn't strike me as the nicest bloke. Um, then, so my replacements for the front row, I'm going Ellis Genge, Ken Owens, Carl Sinclair. Carl Sinclair's a crucial one. Obviously, against South Africa World Cup, he got knocked out after like three minutes, and that was bad. Um, also, going to give him a second chance, and well, a, a second chance Alliance Tour after getting arrested last time. So he's he needs a bit of a yeah. He can come back to the Lions tour on best behaviour, which we will never get. Best behaviour. Um, another a look replacement, James Ryan from Ireland. I think he's just lovely. I think he's just been um, fantastic. I think twenty six caps for Ireland now, and just brilliant. And he's really young. Uh, he's really young. Is that how how old is he? I keep asking questions and not knowing the answers. Yeah, <laughs> he's twenty three. He's he's, he's very so young. young. Yeah, and he's lovely, I think. So let's see. Um, Sam Underhill is a, a flank, like a replacement for the for the flanks. He's yeah, again, kind of just just think he's he's great. Um, Justin Tipperick, I saw your eyes kind of flicker there. No, 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 if, no, no. If we, if I'm gonna right, so I'll I'll debate you while I remember your team because my short term memory seems to be terrible. Okay, but the, okay. I can deal I can deal with Tipperick at seven. Okay, I can deal with that. Yeah. Finn Russell would fly half. I'm not trusting that man with with anything actually. With with with, with anything. Uh, I, I <laughs> how is he gonna manage a test match under severe pressure against the best side in the world? Well, oh, I get it, but you know, it's basically having no one from Scotland otherwise. And what would you who would you who are you put, put in, in there? Dan Bigger? 
I can, um, shall, shall, shall I go through my team? Go on, yeah. Yeah, go on. Right, that's that easier. Um, right, so I've got Mako, Vinipola, Loosehead. Nice. Jamie, George, Hooker. Uh, for, my front five is the same as yours. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I was really, I don't know, I was quaking with Alwyn Jones a bit because he, he's going to be old. Yeah, he's going to be old and he looks battered every match, but I think this is the last horizon for him. Um, you know, he's going to be 36, maybe, I think, by the time the tour rolls around, or 35. Yeah. He's 34 now, so I don't know. Depends when his birthday is. Yeah, I, yeah, he's, he's going to be, yeah, he's going to be, you know, 35, whatever, or 34. He's going to be 36. He's going to be, like, you know, getting old. Well, he's old, you know, in rugby terms. He lost in 09 to the Lions. I think him and Gatlin lost to the Lions in 09. I think he's really going to be wanting to get paid back there. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so I thought he's a great choice for numerous. And he's also a great player, but he's obviously getting on. Uh, Atoje with him, um, and, and back row I've gone Sam Underhill right. uh, with Tom Curry, uh, six yeah. and seven. Uh, I thought they're outstanding in the World Cup. Uh, I've got Billy Vinnie Pearl at eight as well. I think all this rest will be really beneficial. No, I love Falatau, but he's been injured so. Like I know Billy gets injured, but Falatau's been injured so much. Yeah, but Billy, he's broken his forearm four times in two years. This is a problem. He's injured too, but I think he's one broken bone down on Vanapona. I think he's got one more left. <laughs> he's got one more left. Got, yeah, yeah, because they, they, they both keep breaking their forearms, actually, don't they? Yeah, they, they do. I, I, I've gone Billy because he seems to have been playing more rugby over the last few years. Fatal seems to be... Fatal's been playing for Bath, I know, but he hasn't really played that much for Wales. Um, so I haven't seen him at a high level for for quite a while. Um, though, by the way, fully fit, I actually picked Falatel. Okay, fair enough. But I've, I've got Bill gone as a wild card, not wild card, but I have put CJ Sander as a replacement there. Wonder if he's up for your oh, team. As well. Is he is he a replacement on the bench? Yeah, I'd put him as my number eight replacement, CJ Sander. Oh, so he's not on the bench, but he's a reserve in the squad as a, as an eight. Yeah. I, I like CJ Stander. I just don't think um, he's a really good player. Obviously, I just, I just don't think he gives. He, I don't think he brings as much to the table as Billy or or um, or Falatel do. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's a good placement though. Well, yeah, because he can play. He can play across the back row. But then again, yeah. there's there's so much quality as well. Um, mm. And for me, the reason I picked Curry at seven is that he can play number eight as well. And really well. That's that's very true. Actually. And really well. And everyone was hammering Eddie Jones when he picked him at eight. So what's he doing? What's he doing? And then he's, he actually had a really he was, he was having a good that's Six Nations. It. Yeah. So I, I yeah. went to him. So that's why I've gone Curry seven because he can fill in to, fill in for eight if you need him. Billy eight. Um, it's really England orientated, but I'm not even being biased. I'm just being honest. Uh, ben Young's number nine. Uh, exper experience hitting was hit starting to hit a bit of form again. Mm. Um, after I think he had a poor match against France in the opener in Six Nations, and I think he started playing well. He started picking, and he's also so much experience as well. He's got 93 caps, and he's England's most capped scrum half now. And also, uh, Lions tour wise, he didn't play last one because of the tragic death of his cousin, sorry, his cousin's brother, Tom Young's his wife. Um, but he played in 2013 as well, so he's got experience in the Lions as well. I've got, I've got an Owen Farrell 10. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. And that was one of the reasons why I put Farrell inside centre was because I knew that he could be, yeah, fly half as well. Yeah, he could, yeah, he could play 10 as well. And I just thought, um, I just can't think right now. Like, I can't think like, Finn's not even playing for Scotland for me. So I looked at him because he's, he's, Finn is probably the most talented, by the way. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I don't know, didn't, didn't really, yeah. And then... Um, one cap and it wasn't, it was against hurric Hurricanes. It wasn't like... Um, oh, he didn't get a proper opportunity, no. I think he's only. I don't think he's got a test cap. I think he's only got one against um, the Hurricanes, but I don't know. I think, yeah, I think so. No, you're, no, you're right. No, I think he, did he play well in that match or not? I think he actually played quite well. He came on for a, as a as a replacement from Dan Bigger when he got a head injury. I think. Oh, great memory! That is a great memory. <laughs> I um, I didn't, I didn't watch it live, but I, I remember. But was, was Finn called? Finn, Finn was called up though, wasn't he? Was he in the original squad? I think so. There were two Scottish men in the original squ squad. One was Stuart Hogg. So was that? Does that mean the other one was Finn Russell? No, it wasn't. It was Tommy Seymour, the winger. Oh right, yeah. So he was called up then. He's called up. Yeah, he's called up. So no, no yeah, I've gone Farrell because I love bigger. Uh, I love Russell, but 
I don't, I, I want someone with better uh, attacking skills um, yeah. than, than bigger um, and gets the backline firing a bit more. And then with Finn, it's just consistency. I can't, mm. I can't trust him not to make a mistake. Um, and, and then centers, I've gone uh, Manu Tolangi 12. And I've gone Jonathan Davis 13. Because I, I know Jonathan Davis will be 30. Manu, I think he, that explains himself. He's just a freak of nature. And you've got Jonathan Davis at 13. I thought he's, he's, been, he's always amazing. When, when you need him to be good, he is. And the World Cup for Wales, he was awesome, wasn't he? Yeah. And, you know, for the Lions, he's just superb. And that is a, yeah, that is a lovely partnership there. Fair. I, I know he's been injured loads, though, but um, I know he's been injured loads, Jonathan Davis, and he's, he's had injury problems. But I just I still think for one last time, you know, for three tests, he can do it. Um, he's 32. He's, he's pushing, like, he's, he's, he's quite old for rugby. No, he, no, no, he is quite old. He is quite old. I, I, I think 33, he could still do three tests. And again, he might, that, might be, that might be him done then. Um, yeah. I've got Liam Williams on the wing, uh, 14, uh, because I... You know, he's played fullback. He'll be safe and reliable. Great running game. Tough as nails. Good defence. Um, I think I think Elliot Daly is a great player, but I think he's dropped off a little bit. Um, so I think Liam is more deserving. Yeah. Liam, he, there's the thing. Liam Williams didn't miss a test in the 17 tour. I, I like him. I like him. But I, yeah, I, I, haven't, inclu- I haven't included him. I've had, I've, I changed him for Hogg. You, 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 you've gone, um, who's your other winger again? What's, what, Watson's a great player. I haven't picked Watson, see? Yeah. The thing is, yeah, no, to be fair, uh, you, could, you could probably switch Liam Williams for Anthony Watson and you wouldn't lose too much sleep over it. I just think Watson's got the physicality about him that Williams, and I mean, like, Williams is so good at going into contact. He's not, he's so, like, fearless. Um, Anthony Watson, you can't try, maybe he's too fiery a character for Springboks. It's good, you know, you, you need more of a clinical player, potentially. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't mind swapping Anthony Watson for Liam Williams. I'd happily concede them. That just, I'm actually the same as you. I actually love Watson as well. It's just, yeah. I've just got Liam Williams. I think he'll suit the Lions a bit more, um, and, and and South Africa. That I think he'll he'll suit that choice a bit more on the wing. Uh, Watson's definitely in my squad. Um, I like you. I've gone Stuart Hogg fullback. I think he's the 13 tour. I think he was very very young and didn't really get a look in. 2017, he got injured in one of the warm up games. Yeah. Um, so I feel like this is his time now to really show us what he's about, you know. Um, Absolutely agree. It's exactly why I put him in. He's a world class player. He's just been really unlucky with injuries, and I think he is our best fifteen. Um, though I'd, again, I'd be happy having Liam Williams there if, if I had mm. to. Um, Isn't it nice to have so much choice? We don't not always have this situation where we're like happy to change. <laughs> I, I, I think the depth last tour was the best we've ever had. Mm. Um, because I, I feel like players at the moment have dropped off a little bit, and it, yeah. it makes it easier to distinguish. Like I love CJ Stander last tour. Like it was, it was. I couldn't even see a universe where I didn't pick him, and now I've just, <laughs> I've, I've no. <laughs> now I've seen him drop off a bit. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, you're still awesome, mate. But I'm gonna pick someone else. <laughs> Fair enough. I think I also had two wild cards that I wanted to put to you. Go so on. You so I put a wild card back and a wild card forward. So I, I would have played this game if you if you had told me, Jess. Okay, yes. sorry, I didn't really think. I was just kind of <laughs> thinking. Um, and so my forward, Rory Sutherland. So uh, yep. yeah, seven caps. I think he's fantastic and kind of really transforming the Scottish scrub and making it a, con- a contest. And my wild card back is Joe Cock and a Gra- Great shout. Cock and a singer is a great shout. I didn't, I didn't, I totally, it was bizarre Cock and a singer. He played the Autumn Internationals in 2018 and then bit the Six Nations and then he sort of tailored off a little bit just because the other wingers are amazing. Because he, he, didn't, he didn't play in the World Cup then, did he? He's incredible and I absolutely would love to see him playing for England more. But I think him as like a little, you know, traveling reserve or something for the lions just you know comes on i think he could be an absolute rocket i just think he's fantastic and he's got the physicality yeah he's, he's brutal in the conduct area he, he would suit the tour physically wise like, we need players like him to, to cope with them mm. yeah absolutely we you know um 
you're you're kind of getting hit, getting up, hitting another ruck, hitting another mall, getting up, you know, all of that with spring box. So I think we need players who are like who can push through contact and who can really um, extend the game out to the wing a bit and allow the game to stop being so forward heavy because that's what the spring box will force. And I that's think he point. allows that, he allows that kind of to extend the physicality, as it were, to the wing. So would love to see him in a lion shirt one day, but I think we might not see him for another another. Because there's fight. so many good players, and, and and there's a lot of players that will be competing with him. That will be their last tour, and then yeah. I think for, for him it won't be his last tour. So it's you know it's a hard one because it's like do we take Joe or do we take Liam Williams? It's probably gonna be Liam Williams' last tour. Let's take him. Yeah, he's only 29 though, but. It, yeah, he's he's not the uh, Liam Williams. I mean, but he's not the, you know, I yeah, I get what you mean. It is probably his his last tour. It's his last tour where he's you know kind of undoubtedly you kind of want the main him. Ma one of the main men. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's his last, definitely kind of like starting tour, isn't it? I think so. At thirty three, it's hard. But you just get slower in the back three. You just get slow. Four years is a long time as well in you know, breaking into your thirties there. Um, yeah. I'll do the rest of my, my bench. It was just Ken Owens as hooker replacement. Is that, that's, that's what you had, isn't it? Same as mine, yeah. I had Joe Marler. Because um, I, I, just, I just think a character for the squad, first of all. But not even that. Is Scrummaging's bloody good. And when he came on in the final against Africa, he actually um, solidified things up. And it, that's, that's where England really suffered, was when Mako was actually starting loose head. So if it goes wrong again, just swap him. Yeah, fair enough. He is. You're right. You need characters like that for the squad. And this, this. Uh, so you need a Genj. It's Genj or Lucid on the bench. Yeah, yeah. So I had uh, Genj and Sinclair. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had, I had Sinclair. I had Sinclair as well. I had Sinclair as well. Yeah, um, he's a character, but he's like a bad character. Like Joe Marler, obviously, like you know, not the best recently. And whether you could have him and Alwyn Jones in the same team without there being fireworks, oh God. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, he would be fantastic for the team. And the team that I have are quite... Um, you don't really see there being much, like, hijinks there. OK, I've got you. Okay. Oh, Gen Genj could be spiky. Yeah, yeah. There are a few young There are a few young men there. I mean, the Toje, to be fair to him, like, he was getting really in on the um, the jokes like, on the last tour. So, even, you know, we could see we could see some fun. But you've got players like, like Tipperick, Alan Jones, who you know... You're never. You're not really going to get that much of a a laugh from. So you do need players who are a bit younger and a bit. Yeah. Well, not even. Well, Joe Marler's not young, is he? But you need kind of that banter in the team for sure. I think it's so important. Well, I think I think Haskell was a, ma a massive asset in the last Lions tour in that sense. Um, Absolutely. I, I picked James Ryan by the way, second row on the bench. Uh, all oh, the points. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the points you were saying. I, I think he's absolutely. I, I nearly started him actually because I was thinking Alla Wins getting. You know. He's getting on. And if you start James Wright, the only problem is you, you lose a lot of leadership if you drop Alwyn. That's, tr that's really true, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and James could come off the bench, couldn't he, and, and make an impact anyway. Yeah, he's young as well. So I think that suits, like, coming off the bench, you've got that fresh legs. Did you pick yeah. a captain? I didn't pick a captain. Oh, I did. Mind, mind Alwyn. He'd ha you'd have to. Like, who else are you going to give it to? Al Alwyn would be Titanic. So, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, you have to give it to our win. The only person, say our win is injured in the next, you know, couple of months, he can't play. The only other person who I think would deserve it, and bear with me on this one, would be uh, Justin Tipperick. And that is because he did not miss a single tackle in the 17 tour. And he started every test, I think. I think. Did, did he, he start? start? He featured. He definitely featured in everything, every single one. Oh, no, no. I think, I'm not sure. No, oh, Warburton was started. Yeah, he didn't start. He only has, he's only had one. Yeah, but he, he, I think he's only actually had one appearance in 17. So I'm completely wrong there. But he's never missed tackle for Lions, which is, a, which is something that no other player can really say. I don't it's, a nice, think. it's a nice stat. It's a nice stat. I think he's the only player that can say that. I think he's the only player that can say he's never missed tackle playing for the Lions. And he's, the, his, the way he's been playing for Wales, like that try. Oh. Um, Six was, Nations against England. Yeah, oh. it was just. Um, incredible. Yeah. So yeah, I think he's the. Uh, if Aaron Jones wasn't uh, for some reason cannot play, he is the person who I'd give it to. If if not, yeah, I don't think I'd give it to Farrell. I don't think he's like. I don't think he's liked enough by the other nations players.
I th- let's have a look. Yeah, you've got a good point there. You've got to make sure the other players respect them. Um, yeah. Has to be a work like has to absolutely like be the donkey of the team really to be captain. It can't be Farrell just because of the other players. Pro- it, it, it might it might work. You don't know. Maybe they all like him. Maybe it's just the media lying. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, captain, who would I go? No, I go Alwyn if he's injured. I, th- I think Atoja yeah. could be a decent shout. No, 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 too young. Very young, but he's incredible. Yeah, I think I think I see Atoje. He's like, well, he's going to be twenty six next and on the uh, next year. Very young, but I would support him if they, if you know, if it was like, oh, he's going to be captain for this game. I'd be like, wow, okay, yeah, I'd, like I'm, I'd support that. But he's I, very I, young. I'd be interested to see. I, yeah, I think I think Atoje would have been England captain, but he was too young, so I thought. If Farrell yeah. is so experienced, let's give it to him. I, I see Atoje yeah. in the future becoming England captain. Then. Yeah, no, definitely. I can see him as, you know, one day being Lions captain, without a doubt. I can see that. I really but, can. He's so respected. He's a great player as well. Great player as well. He's not, yeah, yeah you're, you're right. He is respected as well. He is respected. He's quite example. He does. He does. He does a sort of Warburton thing. Does lets his playing do the talking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I have Tipperick on the bench as a back row. Um, you know, because cause, cause Curry can switch to eight. I don't need another yeah. great on the bench. Um, and I love I love Tipperick, and I think he's a sort of player that is a genuine sort of footballer. The sense that he's he's a very skillful rugby player, and I think yeah. that's the sort of thing South Africa will not want to face. Um, yeah, true. Gareth Davis, uh, scrum half on the bench, J- just because if the game's going bad, I think he could be the sort of guy to come on and maybe get, swing momentum a bit. Um, Gareth Davis in momentum. We we're completely opposite on scrum halves, by the way. We completely. Wait, wait. Who's your not? Who's your nine on the bench? I said Reese Webb. I've gone Gareth Davis. I, Webb hasn't played that much for me. Yeah, just... but Gareth Davis is. Oh, I just, I'm so yeah. I really go don't. On. So, so, go I don't, on. I don't rate him as a scrum half. Like I, I'm, as scrum half, as a, I don't think he's he's. A fantastic player. I think he costs Wales so much. Um, and yeah, I'm not. I'm not his biggest fan. <laughs> I agree. He's not the most complete player, but he has consistently played for Wales the last few years. Has he always made? Right, has he always made the right decision? No, he's done a lot of good things as well, though. And I, and I think if you're if you're losing and you want someone to come on and make an impact, I, right now he's who I'd go to as a backup because Connor Murray hasn't been playing very well for me. For, for, for me, he hasn't been playing very well, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> Reese Webb hasn't been playing enough rugby. Um, and then you, you lose a lot of options. There's, there's not really... There's a guy called John Cooney at Ulster who's been doing very well, but he hasn't really played that much international rugby. And you can't just throw him in at that, at that high level. Know, how do you see Gareth Davis kind of going for Faf de Klerk? Like, how do you see that? Because I feel like Faf de Klerk would start chops in and Gareth Davis here and he'll, he'd be like, sorry, you know, he doesn't strike me. He doesn't have that fire. I mean, if you were going, I mean, if you were going for who would you like to see run into uh, Faf de Klerk, you'd go uh, Willie Hines all the way, wouldn't you? You'd want someone to just boof. <laughs> oh, to, to, to deal with Faf's uh, tenacity and everything. Yeah, can you see Gareth Davis kind of competing for that at all? Maybe not, no. But no, but I would just say Gareth, just don't listen to him, ignore him, and <laughs> just get, and just, just 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 get on with playing and doing and doing what you do good. You know, or just, just don't get involved in that. Um, you, you have know. to though, when you've got a chopsy nine like that, you kind of have to compete there. I'll let the forwards get stuck into it. There is that true at the scrum when they put it in, when they feed it in. There is a lot of niggly stuff going on. I agree with you there. There's something would need to be done. Um, but it wouldn't be a reason I wouldn't choose him. I, I would say Gareth, do what you do. What you got to do. If he loses his head and lets me down, then that'd be different. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. We, we, we have to. Oh, by the way, I actually love Reese Webb. It's just because he went to Toulon and hasn't played for ages. I just can't. I can't trust him in that arena. I actually, if Reese Webb's fully fit and plays really well for Wales for a year, I would actually start him. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I get what you mean, though. Like he hasn't been playing with the same boys for for long. You know, we we've lost him a bit, so yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, I don't know. That, 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 that's my yeah. And then I got bigger on the bench as the replacement ten. Um, experienced could come on. You could, you could actually you could add to the match as well. I know I, I know I, I sort of had a go at his attacking skills, but I also think he's not that bad attacking wise, and he actually is pretty. You know, he, he was Wales as ten when they were ripping up England in the Six Nations. 
Um, yeah. You know, he, he did some really good play there. So, I, you know, I, he, he can make an impact in that way. But he's also very experienced, good game management, good kicking, good leader. Not, not a man. I think he's a man you want to bring off the bench against Africa, you know, it, even if you're doing well or doing bad. I no, completely agree with all those points as well. To Who, be who's fair. your 10? Who's your 10 on the bench? Um, oh, yeah, Dan, Dan Bigger was my 10th oh. bench. There yeah. we go. We're, we're agreeing on that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then my final one was Elliot Daly, like you. Um, I just, he just covers everywhere and he played very well last time. And, um, you know, if anyone gets injured across the back line, he can probably slip in. Yeah, he's a, he's a very good utility player. And, like, you know, Lions experience. But he, he played against the Lions, didn't he, for the Barbarians? This is, this is good knowledge. This is, yes, this is 2013. Uh, yeah. Barbarians, a crap Barbarians team, by the way. I will say that on record. <laughs> played uh, the Lions. I, sh- I won't say crap. It, it could have been a lot better and they could have given them a better game for everyone. Yeah. Could be more entertaining. Um, they played the Lions in Hong Kong, and it was forty-nine five or something. And he he did a um, or forty-nine eight or something. And I, I I remember he did a long distance kick when he was very young. Right. Um, for the Barbarians, yeah, that, that's my sad knowledge coming up. No, that's that's good. That goes much further than my knowledge. I just knew that he had played for and against the Lions, which he's one of the only or if. Don't know if there are any others. That's really? a good stat. That's a great stat. Yeah, that's a great stat. I, I think you're right. I can't. I can't imagine anyone, anyone would have played against them and for them as well. Yeah. Um, We've been on this this call for so long. I need to plug my laptop in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I was going to end it very soon, but I can. I can wait to, for you to do that. And then end. It. <laughs> I'll just plug it in really quickly. All right. Yeah, we have been on for a crazy amount of time. Didn't... <laughs> that's why I asked you, like at that stage, do you want? Do you want? Do you want to end it or not? Because I was like. This is getting. You know, this is already this long. I've got more questions. I was like, I'm just going to make. <laughs> just going to make sure Jess is aware. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't want to keep you for um. For ages. Because like last week, <laughs> I interviewed Gary Tapaus, the Sky Sports commentator, and it was like already 45 minutes gone. And then he's like, "Oh, I'm. You know, I need to go. I need to go soon." I was like, "I was like, oh, cr-. I had like another 10 questions." I was like, "Oh my god!" So like, really, I I went to I went to like my best one, and then managed to get like another 10 minutes out of him. Um, but that's why that's why I asked you. I don't I don't, I don't want to yeah. keep it too long. Um, no, no, I think that's 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 me done, uh, Jess. I mean, if you got anything else to add, then please do. But I thanks for coming on. I've really I've actually I've genuinely really enjoyed this conversation of it. It's been less like an interview, more of a chat, and I've. I've really, really enjoyed it. So th- thanks for coming on. I'd, I'd love to have you on again as well. Oh, thank you. No, I've really enjoyed it. It's so nice to to be on and to chat about women's rugby in a way that, you know, it's nice. It's really nice to chat about women's rugby and just have the space to properly talk about it and not just be a rushed discussion. So really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I'd definitely come back. <laughs> thank you very much. No, I will, um, I'll make sure I clip, I'll clip uh, pieces and then um try and get them going around Twitter and stuff because uh, it's, it's not lots of things there that we spoke about aren't spoken about yeah absolutely <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't pointing to anything by the way <laughs> no, 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 it was my, my boyfriend's out the window <laughs> oh okay okay yeah okay. it's all right, all right um, cool. he's got a key. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah no absolutely I think you're right it's nice to have a proper discussion and that it's been really nice great thanks Jess uh, take care and um I'll see, I'll see you on Twitter for sure. See <laughs> you on Twitter. <laughs>